Hello and welcome to Carp Fishing Edges, Volume 2. It's mid-March and thankfully spring is finally in the air. You've joined me here at Hollybush Lakes. I'm pushing my bar around, trying to find some carp to catch as the UK recovers from probably the wettest winter in living memory. And whilst we'll take a look at this trip, we've got 10 other sessions for you to enjoy that our consultants have done over the last eight months from waters in the UK to venues abroad. Yet again, our guys have done the business and put some incredible carp on the bank. So, whilst I continue my mission to find some carp to fish for, sit back and enjoy a session that yours truly had at a stunning lake in the Garden of England, Kent. There is a boy in the man you see before you. I'm here at Cottington Lakes, which is a series of pits near Deal, down in sunny Kent. Uh, it's August, uh, a dour time of year it can be when the temperatures are high and the fish aren't at their most active. This place is special on a few accounts. The fish are absolutely stunning and they're very cooperative. I got here uh, a little while ago before everybody arrived and I've caught myself a typical Cottington Common. It's absolutely stunning and it weighs 25 pounds and 12 ounces. Now, it's just about to get dark. Uh, I need to get this fella back. I need to get my rods in the deeper water for, ton for tonight and get a good night's sleep because tomorrow we're going stalking. Just before I do drift off into the land of Nod, I've caught myself another one. And if that Cottington Common didn't impress you, just look at the scales on this beauty. 23 pound and six ounces, absolutely stunning. Shows you exactly what's on offer here and exactly why I'm so excited about having a sneak around the margins tomorrow. I really, really can't wait. last night uh, I had those two fish just as it was falling uh, into darkness and apart from a couple of bream I had a very good night's sleep. I woke up first light this morning and there was no activity out in the open water and if they're not feeding in front of me then I have to go out and find out where they are doing their feeding. I saw a couple of fish show just off this reed line that I'm going to put a bait in in a minute. Uh, that's where the fish are, I believe. I investigated it yesterday and I'm going to put a rod just to the side of a tree that overhangs the margin. It's very choddy underneath that tree, lots of leaves and twigs, but just to the left of it, it's very clear and very hard. A spot I think the, feed on, the carp feed on quite naturally. An ideal place, therefore, to put a hook bait. So, all I've got to do now attach my little PVA bag, drop it into the edge, slacken everything off and do everything in my power not to let those fish know they're being fished for. And hopefully we'll get the bite we will. bubbles coming up over that little bit of bait I put over the top. I only put two small handfuls of pellets over the top of the bag and uh, there's, they're, they're starting to bubble on it a little bit now. It's a lot firmer down there, it's not going to sheet up with the silt but uh, it's so exciting and I'm just hoping uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get the bite that I'm, I'm so desperate for. It's, uh, it's what I love about fishing and this is for me the most exciting form of fishing and uh, yeah I wouldn't have it any other way I don't want it to be easy but I want to have like a bite right now and uh, it's probably why I love this form of the sport so much Amazing. 
amazing. I've uh, been sat here wondering why I haven't had a bite. And... Oh no! Oh, that is so painful. Oh no. How can it be so cruel? Oh dear. I was sat there bemoaning my lack of action. And, uh, of course, all it takes is a little bit of patience. And uh, I've come to a spot there was a bit of activity. I've got a bait in position. It, it's gone, and the fish has gone straight into the reeds. I've got it out, and, and it may have done some. Uh, it may well have weakened the hook hole while it was in there. I had to try and force it out of there, and uh, unfortunately, it fell off. It wasn't the first time, and it most certainly won't be the last. But it's as painful on it every single occasion. Damn. Right, don't get mad, get even. I've had to come all the way around here uh, to to get it out and it is out and I'm now I'm going to run that way and get to my landing there which believe me is all a little awkward this looks all a bit messy but I think that's one of the beauties about stalking we get so hopelessly out of control <laughs> he's down here and he's absolutely playing the ball with me. Right, hold on, let me see if I need to get a bit more control. Thankfully my landing lets sit in there. Uh, like my knight in shining armor. He's still moving. Oh come on boy, stop it. He isn't a monster, but it's as I said earlier, it's it's the method in which you catch him. <laughs> I know we all want to catch a, a whacker, but it's, uh, when you put a bit, in a bit of effort in and you've been a little bit proactive, I can guarantee you'll look at those photographs with a little bit more satisfaction if you've been sat there for 24 hours, boring them to death. <laughs> Just when I think I've got him beat, you are going to be amazed. I mean, I can imagine everybody's thinking, looking at that rod and how long this is actually taking, that this is a bit of a monster, and it isn't. It absolutely isn't. I've probably caught fish three times the size of this that haven't fished, ha uh, haven't fought half as hard. Now, all things being equal, that is in the landing net. <laughs> well, that's... You've probably noticed all the way through that, as nervous as I was, I haven't stopped smiling and uh, it's really what carp fishing should all be about and uh, as I say, it's chasing carp around in the edge and uh, reacting to the way that they're feeding and the things that they're doing is uh, it's the pinnacle of carp fishing for me and uh, we've landed a carp, matters not how big he is, it's simply the fact that we've caught him, so I think the next thing to do, get him out of the landing net and have a look. He's a man carp, isn't he? Look at his eyes of impacts. <laughs> and there you go, a mid-double common. Uh, result of being in the right place at the right time. Um, it's so important in all types of fishing, really, to be where the fish are. I walked down here because I saw some bubbling from afar. Um, by the time I got back in my gear, that bubbling had subsided, but the carp were still here. I managed to get a hook bait in position and uh, Unfortunately, uh, I lost the first bite we had, uh, but almost straight away, once I got the rig back in position and fishing properly, with the line slackened off, the rob was away again. Uh, and, uh, and this is the result. It doesn't really matter about the size of the fish. I know we all want to catch monsters, uh, but it's the way it was caught that is uh, the thrill for me. I've every confidence in everything I do, including the rig. It's a rig that I've used for most of my fishing life. All right, the materials have changed, but the mechanics are exactly the same. And I think now is a really good time to take a look at the rigs that I'm using. 
and so to the rig itself. Uh, I have to be honest with you, uh, the mechanics of my rigs haven't changed since the very first day that I cast out a hair rig. I like a long hair, I like that hook bait and hook separation. I want the angle at the eye of the hook to be aggressive. I've always used some kind of tubing, whether that's silicone tubing, shrink tubing, or, and I'll, I'll come to that piece of tackle in a little while. I don't like long rigs and I don't like short rigs. And this is the rig that I use for 95% of my fishing be that out in the pond or in the edge. This is six to seven inches of strippable camo tech, 15 pound soft. Soft is ideal because it follows the contours of the lake, especially in the edge where you might have sticks and little stones and whatever on the bottom and that will follow the contours and not stick out and make it obvious to the fish. At that end, I've got an overhand loop, not uh, an overhand figure of eight knots, sorry, protected by an anti-tangle sleeve to facilitate attaching it to my quick change swivel. Down to the business end. There's a size seven SSC hook there. It really is my favorite hook pattern. It's no knotted onto my Camatech hook link and the knot itself is set up with a liner liner adapter. I used to use shrink tubing, but I can get exactly the same effect with this without using up so much of my valuable fishing time. A long hair, a dumbbell hook bait tipped with a little bit of yellow corn. Just gets rid of the, the, the weight of the hook and hopefully, and it's a confidence thing, that behaves quite naturally to the fish. If you look closely, I've trapped the boilie stop into the mesh. Long hairs are very prone to tangle, even in stalking close in situations. So once I've done, put that into there, that's just gonna lie on the bottom and melt and my presentation is absolutely guaranteed. Now, it would be very, very naive to think that the carp swim around in that little six inches where my hook bait is. And as detailed as that rig is and exactly as I want it, there are other areas of our terminal tackle that need just as much consideration. The rig itself is swiftly attached to the quick chain swivel push the anti-tangle sleeve up it. The quick chain swivel is inside an edges leg clip. This is the normal one. Uh, there is no weed in here as such and um, it's slightly ribbed, keeps the lead on there. There's no need to discharge it every time you get a fish. Down to a flat pair of lead of three ounces. Again, it's a lead that I use for most of my fishing. It's slightly flatter and hopefully not quite so obvious on the bottom and just adds to that camo effect. And to the leader itself, there's four foot of submerged lead-free leader on here. It's very, very heavy material, but by the same token, it's very, very supple and totally camouflaged. That suppleness takes it into those little dents uh, and over little lumps on the bottom and again add into the camouflaged effect. A carp when it comes into the edge or not just because of angling pressure is he going to be on the back foot. He's worried about predation and other things that go on in his environment and he knows he's uh, uh, in danger when he comes into shallow water. So anything we can do to disguise the fact that they're being fished for is okay with me. look as a cursory glance, have a good look, don't look out the water, look in it. Uh, I saw a fish just under the surface and swirl away, look like quite a good one and I just looked down and there's three humongous tails uh, feeding happily on my pellets so I'm going to just have to bite, bite my time, just wait for them to move off and get my bag in nice and quiet so uh, this might take a few minutes. But, uh, Whether I'm fishing out in the open water or I'm fishing in the edge, bait to me is the most important part of the equation. If I can get the carp feeding how I want them to feed, then invariably I'll catch them. However, when they're in the edge and the carp are at their most nervous, the last thing you want to be doing is making a lot of noise while you're introducing your bait. If I'm introducing bait with the, you know, the possibility of fishing the, the, the spot later on in the day or the following day when the carp aren't present, and there's nothing better than doing it by hand. 
yeah, I can put that out there, put it exactly where I want it, and, uh, and, and there's really no dramas as long as the carp aren't present. However, when the carp are present, I don't want to make any noise whatsoever. And this is the beauty of a quick chain swivel once again. I use PVA bags a lot in my fishing, obviously one attached to the hook, but I very often bait up with them. What I do, save any old bits of hook link material, all I do is tie it in a loop, and I put a hook on that loop. And what you do then on your quick chain swivel is you put that on, put it on nice and tight. All I do then, get your PVA bags, as many as you need, get them all tied up, ready to rock and roll. And then I can just lower that down onto the spot. Two or three seconds, I lift it up, I can put another bag on. I can put five or six or as many as I like on that spot. It One, it's done it very quietly. Two, that's a very unique baited area with pellets and boilers in little tiny spots. And then finally, I take that off, attach my rig with the, B, with the PVA bag attached and lower that back onto the spot. It's a unique area that's been baited quietly and very, very often it works. Now, there's one other method that I use and that is the baiting spoon. Uh, especially effective in more shallow areas, anything under five or six foot. The problem is when you put lots of tiny items in there they'll all sink at different rates and the deeper water it has to fall through the more those baits will spread out. I like to keep things nice and tight when I'm fishing in the edge but the baiting spoon is so quiet and it actually gets everything in there. You can even put your rig in there when it gets time to put it in. Just ship it out and slip it onto the spot. Absolutely perfect. The main thing here is to reduce the noise that you're going to make. And again, it all boils down to not letting the carp know that you're actually fishing for them. The day that carp fishing stops me feeling that way is uh, probably the day I uh, give all my fishing tackle to charity. But uh, while it's still doing that to me, uh, I think I'll keep on fishing. Right, I think the trick is we'll just leave him there in the net, get the unhook him out, sort it out, and we'll have a look what we've caught. How special is that? Awesome. Lovely. Look, I know that stalking ain't everybody's cup of tea. But I've always felt the whole point of going carp fishing is actually to try and catch a carp. You can sit there for an hour on end looking at motionless bobbins, but sometimes you've got to be a little bit proactive. I've written it a thousand times, let the carp tell you how to fish for them. I baited a couple of spots yesterday evening, after a day I caught some fantastic fish up the high 20s. But this morning was a different day. Uh, the fish didn't really want to play ball, <laughs> neither does this fella. We lost a small common and followed it straight up with a 15 pounder only minutes later and the rest of the day was dire. It got hot and it got very humid and the carp reacted accordingly. It took ages to even see the fish feeding in any form but when they did, right behind the reeds behind me on the other side of the bay from where my bivvy is, I picked up a rod, picked up a few PVA bags and I flicked one out. 40 minutes later I've brought the, caught this beautiful 21 pound cot into the mirror and I can't think of a better way to end my session. It's been fantastic. And on that note, as the sun's gone down over the horizon, I'm off up the bar for a couple of cold ones. I 
I really enjoyed that session down in Kent and hopefully now the weather is warming up, there'll be plenty more of that to come this year. In fact, this is probably the second warmest day of the year so far, so I'll certainly be looking for some stalking chances a little bit later on. Now, I've settled into my swim. I saw several fish show out by an island about 70 yards in front of me, uh, and that's where I've positioned a couple of hook baits. They went down with a nice dong at the bottom of the island margin, and I haven't had any action so far, but now my intention is to put a little bit of bait in. Now, a couple of weeks ago, through immense guile and cunning, I managed to relieve the product development guys of the new Rangemaster carbon fibre throwing stick. And it's this that I've been using to bait up with my normal boilies. It's lightweight carbon construction and the easy to access loading port make it the most effortless exercise. Throwing sticking can be a laborious exercise, but this carbon fiber throwing stick makes the whole exercise so effortless, which means I can get into my rhythm very quickly. A very important aspect of using a throwing stick, and it means I can get those boilers on the same spot time and time again. As I mentioned in the last segment, bait can very often be the key to carp fishing success, and this little device makes it so much easier. Now, moving on to the next session. We're off to a Peter Per Gravel Pit with Lewis Porter. And this session is a little bit different because there's more than carp swimming around his hook bank. The underwater world fascinates everybody. And as anglers, we love to see what goes on below the surface. Now, I write a series in Carpology magazine called Below the Surface, Testing the Pros. And what we do is we take a pro angler out to a lake, get them to cast out, tell us what their spots like, bait up, and we have a look and see if they're doing what they think they're doing. Now, one of the issues with that is, of course, you only get to see the stills photo. So today, we've come down to Tea Kettle Lake, out in the fence, and we've got a man with us today that hopefully is gonna get things absolutely spot on. Who is it? Well, it's one of the lads, Lewis Porter. Now the plan is, Lewis is taken to a swim that he's not seen before. He's got to chuck the marker float around, find a spot, tell us exactly what's down there, and approach it in the way that he would if he was fishing. Lewis, what are you finding? A lot of weed at the moment. <laughs> um, the float isn't even dropping through the water. It's, uh, as soon as it hits the surface, it's just, it's just solid. Um, yeah, so at, at the moment, um, I'm just working my way around in a bit of an arc and uh, waiting for a drop which has a little bit of a drop that's a bit a bit soft I still think there's weed in yeah now the water here is absolutely crystal clear and one of the first things I do whenever I get to a lake is walk straight up the edge have a look in because that will tell me an awful lot about what's going on below the surface clear water usually means weed and Lou what have we got here there are lots and lots of Canadian pond weed um, most of the gravel pits in and around this uh, Neem Valley are very rich and have a lot, a lot of Canadian. Like you say, the water's gin clear. So a lot of, you know, we've had the whole summer of the, you know, we've had a very hot summer. Um, and it's, you know, the sunlight's penetrated through the clear water and made the weed grow. Let's just come in now and have a look at this. Now, a bit of Canadian. That's what we're looking at down there and you can st see straight away where that's broken off. That's quite long strands. It's not bright green, so it's old weed, and you can tell an awful lot about what the bottom of the lake is going to be like from the weed itself. For a start, give it a bit of a sniff. It smells quite clean. Now, if you're smelling weed or seeing weed that's got loads of bits on it, you know the water's a little bit more stale in that area. Whereas here, the water's absolutely crystal clear, the weed smells nice, so fish will be in and around this, but the problem is we can't put a bait into it, so I'll look back to you to try and find a clear spot. Like I said, I'm just working my way around in an arc, and I got a, I got a bit of a better drop as, oh, as I'm working from, from left to right. And I'm just hoping if I just keep working at a, a nice, comfortable range, I'm sort of casting about 60, 70 yards, uh, that eventually, if I can get a, something to work with, I'll, I'll then concentrate on that area. So I'm just going to keep working my way around until I, until I get a drop that I'm, I'm happy with to start exploring that area. Now, Lou hasn't been in this swim before, and it really is warts no and all. One of the things we're looking at, and certainly I look at whenever I come to anywhere that's got a load of weed in, is I look for the obvious spots. So just looking on the far side, we've got a tree line with a bit of a drop down. Now, 
that's a great marker for fishing at night and it wouldn't surprise me if out that way it's more or less straight out in front of the swim there isn't something a bit clearer out there so sometimes look for the real obvious spots if you're struggling you know a lot of casting round in weed can disturb fish people call markers carp scarers you know what that's a load of complete and utter horse you've got to get a marker out you've got to find out what's on the bottom because if you just pub chuck it you've got virtually no chance of presenting particularly on a lake like this so Lewis really is up against it at the moment you can just see the way the tips lock him around there it's just thick thick weed this is the joys that we have fishing these gravel pits in the you know summer and autumn time when the weeds at its thickest but as Rob said the fish definitely be in and around this weed and if I can get an area that will get a good drop on I'd, you know, I'd feel really confident at catching fish. I, I don't want to be fishing in amongst this weed. It's, Let's just have a look at that it's again. It's too thick. It's too, you know, I'm not going to be able to get a bait presented nicely, so I'll just keep looking. People talk about chucking a PVA bag smack into the bottom of that. They talk about fishing choddies in it. Risky. Find yourself a clear spot. Don't listen to anybody that reckons Mark floats of rubbish. Get it in there. Find a decent spot. And that's a drop. <laughs> As Rob said, the tree line dips down and can often be an area that people might fish. And there's a, there's, there's a bit of gravel there, it's just tapping on the rod tip. Doesn't feel clean, clean, but it's definitely a, a lot better than what we've just had. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight foot as well, which is a good depth. Um, I don't know this lake very well at all. I've been here once before. That was to do a feature with Steve Spurgeon earlier on in the year. And we fished in the other side. This lake's like two lakes joined by a thin channel. And Steve fished in the other side. Um, this is supposed to be the shallower side. It's certainly you can see through polarised glasses. This area here is, is like a foot deep. You can see the bottom all across here. Um, the, the plan was, as I said, I worked my way from left to right. So I've cast to the left. I know it's a bit deeper. And I'm trying to just find an area going towards this real shallow area where we can find a clear area this feels clear I'm just gonna have another cast out there now now I've got the, managed to get the float up which I've been chucking a lead for this marker lead for about 15 minutes working my way from that left round and I've not even been able to get the float up so uh, <laughs> this is definitely an encouraging sign and the fact that it's on that line which drops down on the on the horizon it may well be that the uh, the members on this lake who fish this swim are perhaps regularly baiting this drop down Hence why it's so clear. So I'm going to just go back out there. I notice you're stopping your line there. Just talk us through what you're doing. Yeah, so basically it's a bit unorthodox. Um, most people perhaps trap the line with, with their right hand, which they're holding the rod with. But I try and keep the weight of the rod into this hand and then concentrate on trapping it with, with, my, with my left hand and then I can still feel that lead down. So I've trapped it roughly where I, where I just had the float popped up and I'm just concentrating and trying to feel that lead down. It's gone down with a crack, my tip, I've got a bend in the tip as the lead's going down through the water, but as soon as the lead is hitting the lake bed, the tip is springing back, which is very encouraging. Pretty much everywhere I've cast so far, the tip doesn't spring back because it's landing in weed straight away and it's just keeping the arc in the rod. So the fact that that tip's springing back is suggesting that I'm landing on a, on a, on a heavy, um, clean lake bed. The, uh, the braided main line is, a, is an essential whenever you're doing uh, this sort of work because there's no stretch in the line, so it's, it's allowing me to feel everything. I'm just going to have a little gentle pull back now. Again, I haven't been able to even pull the lead back anywhere else to my left without it just being solid in weed. So the fact that I'm getting the lead to move suggests that it's a lot clearer than anything else I've had. So I'm just going to count the depth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight foot um, so that's definitely the fact that I can drag the lead get the float up and I'm getting a little bit of a tap tap on the rod tip for me Rob <laughs> I, I don't think I'm gonna get anything better so I want to uh, I'm gonna just explore this area a bit more I've had a few more casts to that area that I found earlier and I'm really happy with, with what I've found. It's, it feels really clear. There is a little bit of weed and a bit of soft silt, but certainly the best area I've managed to find in this swim. So it's about seven, eight foot deep. I've got me real clipped up now to that mark. So I'm just gonna cast it out, fill the lead down one last time, get that donk that I know's out there, pop the float up, 
and then I'm going to get my two fishing rods that I want to fish on that area, cast them either side of the float, get them clipped up, I'll then whack them around some bank sticks just so I know how many wraps around the bank stick they are in case I suffer a cut off or a line breakage later on in the session because then it means this marker float rod can go away and not be used again. And then I'll uh, put some bait out. There she goes. Into the clip. Dunk. Lovely. Let's take that out. Wind it down. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. With the float, that's about eight, seven and a half, eight foot. Put the rod down. Cool. Let's go and get a couple of rods and get them clipped up. front I'm uh, going to use my trusted hinge rig that you would have seen me using on the first Edges DVD last year. It's uh, a rig that I use for 90% of my fishing so uh, I don't see the point in, in changing just for the sake of it. What is different though is the, is the boom. Last year when I was at, at Bundy's we were fishing over a clay lake bed so I used the Camatex Soft in, in light camo. It's a, a much lighter hook link material for the light clay that I was fishing over. Because I, as, because I believe there is a, a fair bit of weed in and around the area that I'm fishing, I've decided to go with the, the Cortex matte in, in Weedy Green. I'm hoping that this nice dark matte colour will blend in with the silt and with the weed um, and, and hopefully not look out of place, maybe look, just look like a strand of weed in amongst any clearings that there is out there. The hook section is rigidity, which is our... Uh, normal stiff bristle filament that we use for chod rigs and stiff rigs however this is a, a new prototype version this is a trans khaki version which hopefully will be in as part of the edges range over the coming months it's basically just got a fleck of of, of trans khaki color into it and uh, what that does is hopefully just makes the hook link blend in a bit better with with the the chod and silt and whatnot that uh, that you'll be fishing over as you'll notice, I've still got my cork plug in the pop-up, which I talked about last year when I was fishing in deep water at Bundy's. The reason I, I've kept the cork plug in, even though I'm only fishing in seven feet of water here, is that these pop-ups have been glugged very heavily for six months now. So they've lost a lot of their buoyancy because they've absorbed so much glug. Um, and I don't want a situation where when they absorb the water overnight that they, that they sink and the rig's not, you know, I don't want Rob to go out tomorrow morning and say, your rig's sat flat on the lake bed, it's not working how it should do. That cork gives me consistent buoyancy, so I'm, I'm happy with that. The boom section is 10 inches long, and I've just put a couple of blobs of, of tungsten putty on there just to help pin it down. Got the anti-tangle sleeve and just a lead clip set up with a four ounce lead. Um, very standard, I want the lead to eject as soon as I get a take, as, as we know from, from plumbing the swim, it's very, very weedy around that clear area. And I, if I hook a fish, I don't want to lose it now dropping the lead. I don't advocate it all the time, but in this situation, I think it's vitally important that we drop that lead to give us the best chance of landing the fish. And hopefully, you know, I want to hold a fish up for the cameras tomorrow morning. So that's the hook link and the lead setup. And then just finally, the leader is this submerge in weedy green, which is a lead free leader material um, very easy to splice and is uh, very abrasion resistant. Again, I'm going to be bringing fish through weed beds I want a good a bit of abrasion resistance close to the uh, to the rig so it's a very very simple setup in fact these leaders are actually now available pre-tied they just come with a normal swivel loop to looped on the end um, I've actually chosen to use the quick change swivel that comes supplied with the ready tied leaders because I like to use a loop on the end of my rig so I can change them quickly and then an anti-tangle sleeve over that quick clip just really handy to have them pre-spliced, tied up ready, just saves time and mucking about on the bank and gives you more time to watch the water and hopefully see the odd fish poke its head out. 
So that's it, a nice reliable rig, reliable milky toffee hook bait, and one last thing that has to be reliable and that I have to have total faith in is the free bait that I'm going to feed with, which I need to put in now. It's 18 mil hybrid from Mainline, and I'm going to put it out either with a catapult, if the, the range is, is probably just on catapult range, so I'll try with a catapult first. If I can't get it out with a catapult, I'll use the throwing stick, and the style of fishing what I'm doing with the uh, with big free boilies and a, and, a, and a nice big pop-up rig is I want a nice spread of boilies. I'm going to get some in that clear area, and then other freebies are going to be landing in and around the weed, so they'll be sat at all different heights. So as the fish are swimming over the weed, they're used to picking up baits off the deck at all different heights. So as they come across the clearer area and they start feeding, my pop-up hook baits that are going to be obviously sat off the deck won't be as alarming to them and they'll take them freely. And I think with them being bright white, it wouldn't surprise me if I do have a bite in the night or early morning when Rob goes out there that there might still be some free offerings left because I think the hook bait will be one of the first ones to go as they dip onto that clearer area. So without further ado, I'm going to get the bait in and once the bait's in, I'll wind the marker float in and put both of my rods out to the clip using the marker on the horizon which is the dip in the trees. I don't want the marker out there when I cast the rods in case I get tangled up and create a load of mess of disturbance. And I'll leave the rods out for tonight and then Rob will go out tomorrow morning if I've caught a fish see what the spots looks like afterwards if I haven't caught a fish see whether they've eaten my freebies and left my rigs or whether everything's just as it was this evening fingers crossed a tea kettle carp comes along tonight Okay, so I've put some bait in now. I reckon there's a good kilo, kilo and a half of hybrid and it's spread on a really wide area. Just trying to get them fish moving between each bait and try and build up their confidence so when they come across the hook bait, they get nailed. So get the first rod in and then I'll get my, my other rod in next to it. Like I say, I'm going to fish two rods on this area kind of tight. So here we go. Pressure of the camera, see if she goes out first time. Onto the clip. Feel the lead, donk, lovely. So that'll be my left hand rod. The rod on the rest, on the, on the pod on the alarm. Just let the line go slack for a bit, just so that leader goes down. But I am gonna fish it on a relatively tight line because as we know from the plumbing, there is a lot, a lot of weed out there. And I'm willing to sacrifice a bit of the, the line laying presentation from that aspect in order to give me a better chance of landing a fish if I, if I hook one. So I'm gonna fish the line tight the clutch tight so when I get a pickup the lead ejects and the fish rises up in the water I, the last thing I want is a screaming one tone of the fish plowing through weed bed after weed bed causing me all sorts of a, of a nightmare I'd rather get less runs and land more fish two rods fishing very tightly together on a baited area a couple of milky toffees over a nice spread of hybrid boilies all my work is done. <laughs> All I can do is sit back, cross my fingers, hope I'm fishing effectively and hope the fish want to have a feed. But before the fish can get in and have a feed, Mr Hughes is going to get in in his diving apparatus, swim out there and have a look whether what I think is going on is actually going on. He's either going to prove me right or proper mug me off. Over to you, Hughesy. After following Lewis's marker break through the lake, I came across a big wall of Canadian running parallel to the bank, which dropped away to eventually reveal a clean lake bed with a light covering of silt. This is where I first came across the boilies Lewis had fed earlier. Travelling further up the clear area, there was more free bait, and soon enough his white hook bait came into view. On the first quick inspection it looked well presented just the other side of a small amount of weed. I had to move off quickly as the silt was so soft I was disturbing it very easily. Like Lewis said the next rig was very close by which pure coincidence had also landed on the other side of a small clump of weed. Once again I had to move up as the water was getting cloudy. I took the opportunity to have a look at his baited area. 
As you can see, there was a nice spread of boilies and the carp would definitely have to move between mouthfuls to clean up this lot. Just have a look at this. You can see just how fine the silt is and how easily the gravel underneath can be exposed. Coming back to the first rig, despite the lead bearing you can see the rig has landed exactly as Lewis has described, in a neat coil, giving the fish plenty of room to hang themselves. And if we pause it there you'll notice just how good this trans khaki colour of the rigidity is. The colour simply disappears and for me it's the way forward when it comes to stiff monofilaments. The second rig is almost a mirror image of the first. Lewis certainly got his presentation spot on. Well here we are Lou, for a start the first thing you'll notice is there's a fair amount of silt around sitting on top of gravel with the odd little bit of weed, so you were pretty close with that. Your rig sat lovely, the lead sunk into the silt itself, but everything is more or less buried, and this is basically what it looks like. So the hook's sat up nicely there, pop up obviously very visual, hook links down in that G sort of shape like I expected, coiled up waiting. The lead's really sunk into that silt, hasn't it? you can only just make it... That's weird because I felt a really firm donk and I wouldn't have imagined that it was with the soft the silt would be as soft as that. That's my that's my submerged leader there. So that's slightly off the bottom as I as again as I anticipated because of the tight lines is that Rob? Well partly because of the tight line but also partly because there's a little bit of weed by the side of your rig right. and that's actually lifting it back out because you notice on the lead side of it it's it's sunk down yeah. anyway. So uh, all in all pretty good presentation. Nice bait scattering around the area as well. Yeah. So real nice grouping and both of those hook baits look Absolutely so cock on. If the carp come in and decide to feed, have I got a good chance of hooking one? You know, as much as it galls me to say, <laughs> he's probably got it right. Oh, would you look at that? A lovely little mirror carp around the mid double mark, taking on the right hand rod, which was one of the two rods that I was fishing on that baited area that Rob dived over yesterday. It was a uh, pretty good fight off the fish actually, even though I had to bully it in the early stages just to get it away from the weed beds that were surrounding the, the clear area. But it proof indeed that the uh, the rig was sat right as Rob said it was, and that you know the spot was good. I, you know I can't really be happier to to catch a fish with the pressure that we've had in terms of you know the cameras being here and Rob diving and everything being scrutinised to the nth degree, this little chappy uh, obviously thought what I had to offer him was, was good enough and yeah, I'm really, really happy. It's a mission accomplished and plenty of food for thought. So I'm going to get her back and uh, Rob's going to uh, go out to the spot and have a look to see whether it's changed dramatically since last night, see whether any of the free offerings are left. I've still got another rod out there that hasn't gone, so it'll be interesting to see whether that's still in the same position or whether that's been ejected or moved in any way um, so yeah he's going to go and have a look at the spot and uh, he'll report his finding shortly let's get her back back out in the pond and it was clear that there had been a number of fish feeding on the spot there was virtually no boilies left and plenty of gravel had been freshly exposed just make out Lewis's leader to his left hand rod and as you can see the rig has been moved. If we look at a before and after shot the lead is in the same position but the hook link has been straightened and this could have been a fish or possibly the coots that have been diving or even both. Either way the rig is still well presented and if the carp returned I'm sure it would still do the business. Moving across this is where the second rig was positioned and interestingly you can see a slight crater in the silt presumably from where the carp bolted after being nailed by Lewis's size 5 SR. As you can see it was just behind this clump of weed where the rig landed and proved to be more than a good enough spot to trip up one of Tea Kettle's residents. Well there we go, that was a really interesting eye-opening dive. Now Lewis, at Carpology we normally ask three questions now so I'm going to pose them to you. One, what was the highlight? highlight for me was catching a fish having done everything how I would normally fish um, you know 
you've not helped me in any way to catch the fish you haven't come back and told me to change anything or whatever we've done everything as i would normally do so to catch a fish doing what i know i would normally do was the highlight for sure because of the pressure with the cameras and everything brilliant what's the low light the low light probably i don't really know um the, the there isn't really a, a low light as such you know the, the silt was maybe a bit softer i was getting a really good donk and yep. i presumed it to be more hard you know the, the the late bed to be harder than what it was i was quite surprised to see that there was actually quite a layer of silt on top of that even though i was getting the donk and i didn't envisage my lead to be sunk in and on one of the rigs obviously it was slightly kick, kicked up as it's come out of the silt so that was a bit of a low light um maybe i'd use a lighter lead in future but I'm not sure it's worked anyway so yeah. it's not too much of a low light right last question what's the biggest thing that you've picked up from that dive that's i've fished with a boilie only approach which is 90 percent of my fishing sticked out with the throwing stick about a kilo and a half two kilo of boilies um and you've gone out there this, after i've had the bite and there's like two or three baits left so there are coots diving which are picking them up but you know what late you fish these days that haven't got some kind of bird life trying to eat your bait so factoring in fish and coots definitely would be topping up not just after the bite but i think keep with the stick just a little trickle little and often to make up for some of the ones the birds are eating you know no doubt the odd fish is dipping in bream and tench and what have you so for sure i would um up the regularity of my baiting rather than just stoving it all in in one go spread it you know spread it over baiting little and often yeah you know for sure perfect right i've grabbed this opportunity here at tea kettle fishery uh whilst rob has got all the diving kit on to test one of my own uh theories and something that we also get asked quite a lot on facebook and twitter is uh about tight lines at long range is it the best indication in my eyes it is and actually next week we're going to be going to uh, Grenville in, um, in Cambridgeshire and that is going to have an awful lot of long-range fishing involved and both myself and Scott Day who's coming along with me uh, we will be fishing tight lines because that's our preference so we're going to get Rob out at about 115 yards and test tight lines versus semi-slack lines versus slack lines and just see what the best indication for fishing at long range really is. Right, so I've sunk the line down on that one and I'm going to be fishing this one really, really slack. So the line's going to be on the bottom from my rod right the way out, uh, 115 yards into the lake. Um, I'm going to put the line in the line clip and then I've got the uh, slick bobbin with the mini body. So it's as light as you can be and I'm going to pop it past the ball clip and then into the grip on the slick bobbin head and that basically means that the line can be tight from the bobbin to the line clip but completely slack uh, from the bobbin right out 115 yards into the lake. So Rob's now going to be a carp and we're going to see what the indication's like with a slack line. So the first thing I do is try to give Harry a bit of a liner. Lifting the line behind the lead and there's no movement on the bobbin whatsoever. Lifting and dropping the rig, simulating getting done, and nothing. Then lifting the rig up, slowly moving away while simulating a hooked fish shaking its head, and there is a slight raise on the bobbin. After moving about a foot, there's the first bleep on the alarm. Would you hit this? I'm now moving away at a faster pace and the bobbin rises to the top, holds there, and then pulls out the line clip, alerting Harry to the fact that it's definitely a boat. There you go. When carrying out this test, I usually measured the distance in arm's lengths. However, when I began to count back, I'd moved so far that I lost the spot where I first picked up the rig. But I would estimate I'd moved 12 to 14 feet before Harry was sure it was a bite. Oh. 
Right, so this is the job of the uh, semi slack line now. So we're not going to have it, obviously, the bobbin hanging down by the uh, on the on the floor, resting on the floor. But we are going to have a little bit of a drop on it, and that I'd say is semi slack. Let's see how that goes. Again I start by giving small line movements on the lead which bring no indication on the bobbin. Interestingly when the lead is moved a few inches back there is a very slight drop on the bobbin. If you'd seen it, it would be enough to make you think something could have occurred. Then, moving away, the bobbin gently rises up to the top and holds there. Okay, so it's pulled up tight. But you wouldn't really know whether that's not whether that's a line or not. Yeah, hey, it's out of it now. That's a that's a bar. So we're going to move a fair way before the line is pulled out the clip, but certainly nowhere near as far as with the slack line. Counting back, I'd moved five arm lengths, which is approximately seven and a half foot. Getting better. Right, this one is uh, my preferred way of fishing at a uh, at range or anything from about 60 yards. Personally, I fish a tight line. So we've got Springer arm bobbin, just clips in there like a normal bobbin, but this arm always wants to pull the bobbin down. It's always trying to pull it down and give tension in the line, which, uh, which for me is perfect. So into the line clip there and that is spot on picking up the rig and shaking it on the spot there is no indication so i slowly move away the bobbin starts to rise and then bang the line pulled out of the clip almost instantly there and it's obvious that a fish would not have to move far before you knew it was attached People seem to worry about line lay with a tight line, but in my extensive diving experience I've found a tight line to lie very closely to the lake bed. Measuring that at one and a half arm lengths, approximately two feet, it's clear why Harry and also a lot of the other fox boys love a tight line. Some really, really interesting stuff there from our resident man of fish, Rob Hughes. And there's no doubt that I will be using the trans khaki rigidity for all of my future hinge stiff links. Now, I am afflicted with the need to catch carp from underneath my feet. And a little while ago, I reeled my two rods in and went for a little walk. I'm back now. I'm with a rod and a landing net because I found about half a dozen fish grubbing around on a little spot in the margins. I'm going to go off now, see if I can get a hook bait in position and stop my heart from beating out of my chest. Okay, I've got a rod in position. And next on the agenda, we're off to the Grenville Syndicate with Scott Day and Harry Charrington. This amazing lake has got a monumental stock of fast growing carp. And I know the guys really hope to showcase this venue and what it has to offer. You join us mid-September. We're at the mighty Grenville Lakes in Cambridgeshire. Um, for those of you who don't know Grenville, it's quite a big lake, it's 70 plus acres. Um, as you can see here, we're in uh, an area called the cabin. Uh, it's a fantastic swim. We've got pretty much every luxury that we need as a carp angler here. Um, you see me walk off the veranda here. We're in a couple of gorgeous swims. And just behind us is the, the cabin itself. Um, there's a fridge, a shower, a toilet. So we are spoiled at the moment. But uh, as I say, it's a fantastic swim. Uh, we're here for a couple of days. Um, it's a swim that 
the syndicate members can book or even if you're on the waiting list and you want to sample some of the fishing you can also book in to fish the cabin itself so we're here for a few days myself and Harry the cameras are rolling hopefully we're going to try and catch a couple of fish I'm going to put the kettle on we'll have a cup of tea Well, I've been rudely interrupted on a cup of tea and uh, the middle rod just had a pick up on it. I'll fish it to a spot about 100 yards out. Uh, we put a bit of bait out, some pellet, um, some, some corn, hemp, and I'll sp with the wind behind us, I managed to get a bit of bait out with a stick just so we get a nice spread of boilies. And uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, we might be into our uh, first fish of the session. Conditions are looking wicked, we've seen a couple of fish show. It's just kiting down the right at the moment. some moving around it's not a bad fish There we go. Awesome. That'll do. Fish number one. Right, there we go. What a way to start the session. 32 pound four ounces on the middle rod. So a little bit of bait out there, but I think we've got to put some more out there. There's a few fish around. Hopefully, we can try and bag another couple. Wow, wicked. Not long since um, slipped the 32 pounder back. And the other rod, the right hand has gone this time uh, with this 27 and a half. So uh, we're gonna make the most of this afternoon. Try and get the rods back out and get it all sorted again because obviously the fish are here and they're having it. And uh, we'll let you into uh, how we're doing it tomorrow. Check that out. Good job we got that rod back in quickly. I just had some and some rigs ready tied so I could just unclip the lead and the rig, get it off and get it straight back out again. Same rod literally five, ten minutes later, and they're well and truly on the bait. And as you can see, this is one of Grenville Scalies, uh, 26 pound. I think you'll agree it's an absolute stunner. Awesome fish. Number three and well chuffed. I think we'll be on for a couple more fish, hopefully. And uh, yeah, tomorrow I'll show you how we're doing it.
Right, it's the morning after yesterday afternoon's hectic session. We had no more fish uh, yesterday evening or in the night, which was uh, rather fortunate for us actually, because it was a long day yesterday, early morning, and just quite busy getting everything set up and getting everything sorted. Um, but after those three fish, good night's kip, and we woke up this morning. Uh, it was clear first thing this morning, but it's clouded over now. Um, some wicked conditions out there. We're in a, a good low pressure. It's just started raining, so we've taken shelter inside the veranda one of the luxuries of the cabin swim and um, things are looking good yeah we've just seen a couple of fish behind the spots um, two fish just crashed out and um, it looks like they're on the way back in again for the afternoon feed so fingers crossed we'll hopefully get a bite shortly um, but what I'll do is just talk you through the rig that we were using yesterday afternoon um, there is a, a three ounce lead limit on Grenville uh, no, le no leaders or lead core or any format like that so we're using a, uh, a prototype tubing, this is our trans car key and it's angle tubing and I've got a couple of uh, blobs of tungsten putty on at the top and halfway down just to help sink the, the tubing. Go through to a size 10 slick leg clip and on that is a 3 ounce exocet distance lead. Uh, and then the hook length itself is the Camotec Soft in the light colour. Uh, we're fishing over clay or the area is pretty much clay it's quite clear there's weed behind it so there's elements of different colors uh, amongst the clay but we've gone for the light option because of the clay color um, yeah 20 pound Camotec soft a couple of little blobs of tungsten putty on there one midway just to help sink the hook length and one just behind the hook there because I'm only fishing a little pop-up and then a size 6 uh, armor point triple SP hook and a small 14 mil pop-up um, so that's what did us the fish yesterday afternoon. Um, I've, I've investigated a spot, a long range spot, because we come to Grenville, it's a big lake, and uh, it is known to produce fish at range. The spots we're fishing to are just over 100 yards out, um, and uh, there is weed around them, but there's clear areas in front of them. Uh, but I've got the marker float out, had a cast around, should the fish show at range, which they quite often do here, and I found a spot at range, it's uh, 160 yards. Um, there's a lot of weed between our current spot and the and the new area and I managed to find a clear spot at like I say 160 so we're going to put a bit of bait on that I'll do a little bit more investigation onto that spot keep my eyes open to see what's going on so if the fish do back up off the spots we know we've got another area to consider um, we've seen a couple of fish just to the back of it um, so we'll keep our eyes open and, uh, and make that move should we need to um, but when we do that, um, we'll need to change the rig slightly just to give us confidence of getting the baits out there without being tangled, uh, but also to help us to get that extra range. So I'll, I'll talk you through that shortly and show you how we're going to do that. Well, I've been trying my hardest and try as I might, I haven't managed a bite until now. It's. Um, Probably about one o'clock on the second day. Obviously, Scott had a really good day yesterday. Three fish up to 32. And uh, I'm fishing just round to the right of him. And finally, my uh, my rod's ripped off. It's, uh, you'll probably be able to see the clouds of come in and we're getting a little bit of rain right now but I mean the conditions are absolutely cock on but I can see my uh, spots just slicking up right now that might be from where this fish is uh, kicked off or it might be more fish out there there are a lot of a lot of fish in Grenville and um, yeah middle of September with low pressure you know they're gonna get on the feed we've given them quite a lot of bait we got quite a lot out of the start of the session and I've just been topping up and topping up with um, a bit of particle and some boilies as well and uh, it's worked Clean looking fish. Anyway. Oh. 
certainly giving it all he's got. I think he might. I was going to say, I think he might be tiring, but as he powers off back, I really don't know what to say. After all that, and it's fallen off about five yards out. I'm wet, it's miserable, and I'm absolutely gutted. <laughs> There is naff all wrong with that. Oh! That was a strange one. Middle rod's been looking like it should, like we should get into something. Seen a couple of slicks. And then uh, the middle rod just picked up and gone. He's kited left, which is unusual. All the fish have gone right. Uh, feels like a decent fish, but it's hard to tell with some of these Grenville fish. It's got such deep water, they put a really good account of themselves. But uh, it's felt slow and steady all the way in. Get a bit more of a true reflection now, he's a bit closer. There we go. Yes. Happy days. Right, so there we go. Fish number four. Um, it's the first fish of today. Uh, 33 pound. So, uh, yeah, buzzing now. Um, we've seen a few fish in the area. A couple of flat spots coming off up at the bait. So, we knew this one wouldn't be far away. Oh, we hoped it wouldn't be far away. And, yeah, awesome result. Well chuffed with that one. It's a proper unit as well. Mega fish. Right, that spot we found earlier at 160 yards, we've seen a couple of fish in and around the area now. So I'm gonna, I've just wound one rod in, uh, I'm gonna put a rod long onto this spot. Um, Grenville's got a three ounce lead limit, so uh, it's gonna be difficult to reach that with this crosswind. But what we're gonna do, we're gonna use a solid bag uh, with the weight of the pellet, that's gonna aid the cast. We'll probably have a bag of around four ounces or something like that. Also, what's gonna help me to cast out there is a tapered main line. Again at Grenville, you're not allowed to use leaders or anything, but we need a line that's soft and supple enough and lower diameter enough to get us out that distance. So I'm using our Exocet tapered main line. Um, so I'm gonna use a solid bag rig, just a simple straightforward rig, um, with our inline drop off system and a little quick change rig on it. And uh, we'll get that ready and try and get it out to the spot. Right, I'm just gonna clip this rig on too onto the rig now, onto the quick link, slide the little rubber up, okay there we go, so we've got a reflex light camo hook length down to a size 7 triple SP hook, little pink pop up with a shot on the, on the hook there, um, and we're going to put that into a solid bag now, I'll just get one of our small solid bags 
I'll just compress the loader, put the locking collar on it, feed it into the bag. I'll release the collar. Right, I'm going to put a little bit of, just a little tiny bit of ground bait in the bottom there just to bed the hook bait into. Just going to feed the hook bait into the corner. Just manipulate it to get the rig to exactly where I want it. Okay, I'll feed some pellet into it. It's only a small micro pellet suitable for bag fishing. It'll give us a really nice, tight, compact bag. Um, obviously, we're going to have to get it out a fair distance, so it needs to be as tight as possible. So I'll put some pellet in, bed it down. With these small pellets, you can get the bags really compact because um, there's no air between the pellets themselves, so it's best to use a, a smaller pellet as you can get away with, really. So I've got that pellet in there nice and tight and then we'll just, we'll just finish the bag off. Give it a twist, pour out any of the loose pellet that's been pinched by the bag and then start to push the bag back on itself. Give it a lick round. Use the loader to finish the bag off and then we're going to fold the corners over to get it nice and compact and aerodynamic. Again what you need to do is get this bag as tight as possible because we're going to we're going to try and chuck it a fair old way. So just work the, the contents of the bag to get it really compact and then just lick and stick the corners, fold them over. And again with the other corner. There we go. So I've got a really solid, really tight bag there, probably weighing about four ounces. So hopefully that'll give us the extra weight to get us that distance. Took it out in the pond and see what happens. Right, we just seen another fish right behind the marker. Uh, so I'm going to try and get this bag out there now. Uh, a couple of things you need for, for this kind of range fishing. That's a blank or a, a rod that's good enough to get you out there. This is a 12 foot XTK. Uh, but I had some little specials made with a core candle. Uh, big pit reel, obviously 12,000 XT. Uh, slow oscillation, so you got wicked line lay. Uh, and we've got the tapered, the tapered line on there. And also a finger stall, very important, uh, just to make sure you can protect your finger. Uh, this finger stall, it's, it's got a nice soft lever, so you've got the protection, but you've also got the feel for the cast, because it's really important to be able to feel it properly. Um, you know, distance casting, it's not all about brute force. I mean, I'm only six foot one, but uh, it's more about technique. So uh, we'll give it a go and see if we can get it out there. Just make sure your spool's locked up really tight. You don't want it slipping at all. Okay, it's all about uh, transferring the weight. So I'm gonna make, I'm gonna put all the weight onto my back foot and through the cast, um, I'm gonna make sure I transfer that weight as I go through the cast onto the front foot, that should allow me to compress the, the rod a lot easier. Okay, here we go. Let's give it a go. Bang. Sweet. going to try and mend that line back in there because it's a bit of a crosswind which doesn't make it easy but it's given quite a large bow out in the line so just slowly surely tighten that down and hopefully that'll do us an extra bite.
my middle rod has absolutely flown off and um, I'm into another carp. Uh, hopefully it doesn't drop off like the last one did that I was very gutted about. Hasn't really done a lot apart from right at the start. It, it probably took, I don't know, 20, 30 yards of line. Since then, it's just not really done a, done a lot. Come in pretty much on a straight line. I keep the rod low uh, when I'm playing my fish. Okay, cool. That, um, that looked quite sizeable then. Coming up, is he gonna pop right up? Oh, that's not a bad one. Oh, he's doing his best to ruin my chances. That's a chunky one. And he's in. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a relief. That is a. Uh, a big relief. Well, we'll get him on the mat and uh, and see what he goes. But really chuffed. Well, I was uh, pretty gutted about yesterday's loss, but uh, that's all gone now because this baby is absolute chunk. Weighs thirty six pounds twelve ounces. And uh, it's really, really made my session um, sort of from the despair in the, uh, in the rain yesterday has been made up for this beauty in the sunshine right now. Right then, here we go. One of Grenville's fine scaly fish. This one came to the long range rod this morning. We've not seen a great deal, but um, yeah, the long range rod had a slow, steady take and resulted in this one. So, really happy with this one. Um, just proves that the, the fish that we saw yesterday on the long range spot stayed out there and had a little bit of a munch. What a wicked couple of days fishing we've had here at Granville. Uh, the scaly one was the last one that we had. I'm pretty sure that the fish pushed even further out. But uh, we've had an awesome session. A couple of really scaly fish, a couple of big fish. 
and uh, yeah, we've had a wicked time. Many thanks to Paul and Yaz at Grenville's for letting us film down here. And if you're after a, if you're looking out, out for a syndicate, uh, a, a well-run syndicate with some big fish in it, lovely environment, then Grenville's is definitely worth getting your name down on the list. Oh, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> okay, now I've got this fish out in the open, uh, I can talk a little bit easier. <clears throat> Amazing session for, uh, for Harry and Scott there at Grenville, but their big fish action wasn't actually over for the day. As they were packing up, they got a telephone call from a very, very excited Lewis Porter, who was back over at Bundy's pit fishing, and he just slipped the landing net under a very big fish indeed. Ooh. So, as quick as they could, ooh, the lads packed up and shot over to see what all the fuss was about. Me again. I'm uh, back at Bundy's Pit in this, exactly the same swim where we filmed in November last year for Volume 1 of the Edges DVD. It's the 21st of September today and as you can see it's a bit greener than it was last year and I'm playing a very angry fish that is trying to absolutely nail me down the margin at the minute in a tree. We're not actually planned to be filming today as it's a Saturday um, but Harry the cameraman was filming at Grenville only 25 minutes up the road with Scott Day and you would have seen that by now so hopefully it was an enjoyable section um, and I bagged myself a 41 pound 5 ounce common fish that I've never had from the lake before ah <laughs> done me in the tree yeah pinged off a branch right it's still on um, shall I start again or <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't done me, it was just pinging through a tree. <laughs> I thought it'd come off, but it, it's still trying to do me. I'm trying to talk to the camera and it's doing me in a tree. But uh, yeah, so where am I? Yeah, I've got a 40 pound common in this sling here. I had it about half an hour ago. As soon as I landed it, I knew it would be a 40 pounder. I got straight on the phone to Harry and Scott and asked them if they wanted to come down and f film a 40 pound common for the DVD, which obviously they, they jumped at. And just as I was, oh, just as I was uh, talking to them and just uh, redoing, <laughs> tying myself another rig and whatnot for the left hand rod, which I had the, the, the big common on, the right hand rod has just absolutely melted off. Now, a bit of a schoolboy error, I'd uh, not switched the bite alarm on, so uh, thankfully the sound of my uh, bobbin smashing into the top of the uh, blank on my rod was enough to alert us that. Uh, an angry fella was on the end and it doesn't look like the biggest of fish he's certainly not in the same league as the one sat in the str at the minute but it's a carp that's really pulling hard this one uh, i'm fishing exactly the same spots as what i fished there last year actually um 37 foot deep and uh it's a it's a you know it might sound a bit deep to be fishing in september but we've had quite a bit of cold weather of late after after the hot summer and I came down in the week and did an overnighter just to get some bait in really because I was knew I was coming back for the weekend looks like a stocky actually but a very nice fish um, got some bait out came back in on yesterday afternoon after work and uh, had the rods all clipped up banged them out to the marks and I've had bites on all three rods and uh, the rig is a little bit different to what I was using last year. Still the, the hinge rig, but I'm using a st stiff boom. That's in the net. Cheers, Scott. Uh, the, the boom is a stiff boom. It's the Camatex Light Stiff. Um, I swapped over basically because when I came down in the week, the spot felt, the area where I'm fishing, so the spot, I'm fishing three rods on the area, uh, felt a lot firmer. Um, I think obviously I did very well off of it last year, as did a few other guys. A lot of bait went on there last year, and it seems to be a lot clearer this year. So I put a stiffer boom on. Um, two rods are on the Milky Toffee, my old favourite, and my right hand rod I put on a on an orange tutti fruity pop up, which has been soaked in uh, soaked in strawberry zest. The reason I put an orange pop up on because I had it in my head that a carp that hasn't been out here for nearly three years had a bit of a thing for orange pop ups as a uh, it's been out on orange pop ups a few times, but uh, the orange pop up's gone and 
This guy looks like he's about 25, 30 pounds short of the, uh, of the one that's on the missing list, but it's a carpool the same and yeah, 40 pounder in the sling, 20 pounder in the net, happy days. Right, whilst the big one's relaxing in the STR, I'm just going to unhook this guy. As you can see, it is absolutely nailed. The stiff rig has done its job perfectly in the bottom lip. Very, very clean fish. The old orange pop-up, slightly different to what I've been using for the last few years. Fluorocarbon leader. bit the line and uh, left the rod by the water's edge and just carried the fish up with no rod attached to it just to make it easier and safer for the fish. We haven't weighed her yet obviously because we've just unhooked her. But, um, we'll have a look at a pristine Bundy's Common. Might go 20 maybe. But uh, yeah, very happy with that. It's the fourth bite I've had since since yesterday, so less than 24 hours and four bites. Um, I can't grumble really. Made up. Not fished the lake since May. Came back in the week for an overnight, like I said, just to get some bait in and re-establish re myself with the lake and the swim. And uh, yeah, come back for a September weekender and uh, just working a treat. Well, just put the uh, smaller common back, which weighed 19 pounds on the nose. And uh, now it's time to uh, see my prize from a little while ago. 41 pound, five ounce of angry golden common carp. Bit of water on her. This is actually a fish known as hole in the dorsal as it's got a small hole in its dorsal fin. One of the known big ones. I've never caught it before, so um, new fish for me and really, really pleased. It is a, it's an absolute beast of a fish. Hope she's gonna behave and let you guys see it. Look at that, 41 pound 5 ounce of deep water caught common carp, 37 foot on the hinge rig, milky toffee pop up, I know I sound like a broken record but why change something that works time and time again, it's, uh, it's a rig and a bait that, uh, that works for me. I've been feeding the hybrid as well from mainline over the top. Again, it's a combination I've used on this lake this season and uh, the fish really like it. It's an absolute beast. Fought like a demon. And uh, as you can see, what better than an autumn bar of gold like that? I love this lake. I'm gonna get her back. Well, a monumental capture like this, you don't catch 40 pound commons every day of the week. Got to have a couple of returners in the waders in the, in the margin to uh, capture this moment forever. It's about the only, one of the only shallowest areas on this lake you can actually get in with waders. Most areas you'd uh, be over your head if you went in this far out into the lake. Here she is, one last look. If I can lift her up. Oh. That's what I'm talking about. 41 pound of 
awesome common carp. I know I keep using that word, but what other way can you describe an old English warrior like this? You're going to go home. I'm going to let you go. Just one last, one last picture and then you can go back to the deep. She's gone. Thank you very much. You've made me one very happy carp angler. Right. As I mentioned when I was playing the uh, smaller of the two fish, I have made a couple of tweaks to the stiff rig since coming back on here this year. And uh, I'll get back in the swim and uh, talk you through those changes and why I've made them. Having put the big common back, I promised you a look at the rig setup that I'm using. So without further ado, here it is. The leader material is 30 pound illusion, it's a fluorocarbon, it's invisible on the lake bed. I know this from various times I've been out with Rob Hughes and seen his footage. Once it's pinned to the, to the lake bed, it just disappears. Also offers very good abrasion resistance. Standard lead clip set up, trans khaki lead clip and a trans khaki anti-tangle sleeve. Now, the one thing that I've done slightly different this year coming back onto Bundy's is what I was doing last year when, when you joined me on volume one of the Edges DVD is I've increased my lead size to a five ounce lead. Previously, I was using a four ounce lead. This is really just for two reasons. Firstly, as I mentioned when I was playing the fish earlier, the lake bed feels a lot harder out there. So I feel I can get away with a heavier lead without it plunging into, into a soft bottom. And the second reason is that the hinge rig that I'm using has become very, very popular on the lake. There's there's a half a dozen anglers now using hinge rigs or variations of with a big pop-up off the deck. So I feel that the fish are being caught on it more and seeing it more. So um, I may be feeding a little bit warier. So I want as heavy a lead as I can can get away with to try and prevent them being able to throw the, throw the rig out and using the weight of the lead to do so. So the bigger the lead, the less chance I believe that they can throw the rig out without the hook setting in. So that's why I've gone up to the five ounce lead. The next change that I've made from last year is the boom section. I've got here is the Camatex in stiff and this is the light. Last year, um, whilst I was fishing on Bundy's in this particular peg, I was using the soft because the bottom was, was quite a soft clay with a bit of chod on it and I wanted a, a hook link that would lay over the uh, over these obstacles on the bottom. But as I said, the, the lake bed's changed a lot this year. It's a lot harder out there so I can get away with this with this stiff boom section which again most of the anglers on here who are using variations of this rig are using a, 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 either a soft or a semi-stiff boom. Um, so again, I, I want to uh, try something a bit different, a, a real stiff boom, and hopefully aid the anti-eject properties of the fish that might just be getting a bit wary of this presentation as it's being used quite a lot on the lake. Um, I, I've still got my loop at the end here, which I've got the swivel of the hook section on. Now, as you'll see, the coating hasn't been stripped here. Now, we, it is recommended on the package in the Camatex stiff that you remove the coating to tie knots. But what I've done is, because I want to keep it completely stiff with no breaks at all, is I've pulled the knots down at both ends, well, very slowly and gently over a steaming kettle to make sure that the knot bites down nice and, and tight, but without the coating damaging, which is vitally important, because with material as stiff as this, you have to be very careful of cracking the coating when tying knots. So if you're going to tie knots in the coating on a stiff material like Camatex, make sure that you do it over a steaming kettle. The hook section is pretty much the same as what I've used for the last few years with the hinge rig. Size 5 SR, a reliable hook that does the job time and time again. Milky toffee pop-up, corked out, again, because this gives me consistent buoyancy with an off-the-shelf pop-up. I know from the diving we did a couple of weeks ago with Rob Hughes at Tea Kettle, that my pop-up with this in is still popped up you know overnight and into the morning which is essential if you just use a pop-up out of the tub that's glugged up like i do with mine without corking it might sink overnight and the presentation not be as i want here again i've got rigidity but this is a new version that's being tested this year this is a trans khaki version this is the same trans khaki version that we were using at tea kettle which you'll see on the footage or you would have already seen on the footage of this dvd just disappears on the, on the lake bed uh, it's a fantastic material i've already given it glowing glowing thumbs up reports to the product development team at fox before this session and having banked a 40 pound common on it it's only getting a bigger thumbs up from me 
so it's very easy to work with. This is the £20 version, although I have uh, I have asked the guys if we can do a slightly stiffer version in £25, as £25 is my preferred braking strain, uh, the stiffer the better for this material, as I want it to be as, you know, as stiff as possible for the fish to deal with. So whilst I'm really happy with this, a £25 version is definitely needed. So that's the presentation, like I say, very similar to last year, just a few tweaks. I, I rate this rig so much, and I'm not one of these anglers who every five minutes is promoting another rig to try and sell product or whatever, or feed somebody's ego. I find something I like and I use it because I'm fishing for big fish on hard lakes generally, and I need stuff that's reliable. I don't want to be chopping and changing. It's just not real. And you know, I will tweak a rig. This rig's had a tweak, the stiffer boom, prototype hook link, a bigger lead, but essentially, the same rig that I've used for the last few few years with, with those tweaks just to keep one step ahead of the fish and the other anglers on the bank. So that's the rig that I've used to trick that £40 common that you saw me with earlier. It's uh, done me four bites now on this first 24 hours of my weekend session. I'm going to put this back out and hopefully get another four before the end of the weekend. It's such a healthy environment, these things. Just as lively as you like. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. And didn't Lewis's plan come together in quite spectacular style? Next up is Mark Pitchers. The media team at Fox decided to give Mark a challenge. They asked him to catch a carp from a tricky Cambridgeshire syndicate, a lake that he'd never even seen before. He'd never set eyes on it. Uh, could he do it? Well, while I put this little fella back, I'll let you find out. Good morning. I'm feeling bright and breezy this morning, and with good reason too. I've come here to fish this lake, which is totally new to me. I don't know the first thing about the place, but what I do know is got some really big fish. 30 pounders, 40 pounders, and even one fish, which is actually top 57 pounds. So a serious chunk. But other than that, I don't know anything about it. I don't know what to expect. So I brought my entire armory with me. Um, so I think I'm gonna let myself in through this absolutely gargantuan otter fence and go and have a look around. I've got 48 hours to bag myself a carp. So let's get cracking. you what, I feel like a kid at Christmas at the moment. I can't wait for this session. So uh, let's go and have a walk around, see what we can see. Polaroids on, let's go. I've just broke up a fight between a moth and a wasp. The moth wasn't winning. In fact, I think, I think his injuries May have proved fatal. Oh no, there's life. So, well, a bit of life in him. But um, I prevented him from further injury, possibly preventing him from death. So from that, I would say the carp gods would definitely reward me with 130, maybe it's even a 40 pounder, perhaps a 50. So time will tell. But if they don't, I'd be really annoyed. I've just seen a massive dragonfly. If I had a biscuit, you might come. Dragonflies love biscuits. Well, I've had a good walk around the lake, and although there was a few fish in the old original half in amongst that really, really thick weed, just walked up here to the new extension, I've seen quite a few fish in amongst these pads here. The water's very coloured, there's signs of feeding, there's fizzing going on. So uh, I'm going to go and get the rods and hopefully I can tempt one. Well, although I only made two casts, the fish have already done the off. Um, I've given it an hour and it doesn't look like they're coming back. It's um, 
a typical sort of small water syndrome really. They're very, very aware of what's going on around them. They're quick to move on pressure and it's certainly looking like it isn't going to be easy at all. But in the last sort of five, ten minutes the wind has picked up a little bit. It's pushing down the other end of the lake and I have a feeling them fish might have just drifted out of here and just moved down to that other corner. move swims now down at the other end of the lake. I'm still in the new section of, of the pole um, but I'm on the end of the wind now and there is quite a few fish here so it is looking promising. I think I'll uh, talk about what rigs I'm using now in a bit more detail. Um, right, one of the fishery rules is that no leaders can be used so I've got over that to uh, keep the line pin down. I'm just using these tungsten sinkers directly onto the main line. I'm using the Exocet main line which sinks very well anyway but this just sort of adds a little bit, a uh, little bit extra weight to it, and sure it really does hug the contour of the lake bed perfectly. Now coming down from here, um, I like to use inline leads. Uh, another one of the fishery rules is that uh, inline leads must be fished drop-off style. So I'm using the Edges drop-off kit here. Um, if you break that down, it's got the rubber grommet there, which is uh, that's simply created just by trimming down the insert that comes with the leads as standard, and then we've got the edges drop off kit there the tail rubber and the insert that just simply slides in the lead you then push the grommet in so then when you want to shake the lead it comes off like that really easy we on the quick change drop off swivels here and coming down from there i'm using the 15 pound camatex soft which i've got a little bit of putty on there as well and again to make sure it doesn't rise up off the lake bed in any way and I've got a size 8 XSC hook here. You know, just above that, I've got one of the, the new trans khaki line liner sleeves on there. And underwater tests are showing this trans khaki coloration really gives one of the most invisible colours on the, on the lake bed. And I've just got a simple blowback ring on there. And on this rig, I'm fishing with a little, little stack of maize and sandwich in between that. I've got a small trim down yellow pop-up just to balance it off and when that sort of sits on the lake bed it just pops up off the off the weight of the hook slightly i'm actually fishing with a couple of different hook bait options here on this rod i've got this stack rig of maize on the other rod i'm fishing with a a washed out hybrid hook bait i think what i'll do i'll get the rods in position and we'll talk about the hook baits in a little bit more detail later Now, when I'm visiting the water for the first time, I think it's important not to put all your eggs in one basket, and that's why I've gone for two different hook bait options. Like I mentioned, I've gone for the washed out hybrid fished in armour mesh. Let me just show you that a little bit more detail here. There's a rig I've got tied. You can see I've got a washed out bait wrapped in the armour mesh. And the reason I'm doing that, obviously when you, when you wash your bait out, when you soak it, it becomes very, very soft. So the, the mesh just makes it a little bit more impervious, a little bit more resistant for casting. Plus, I wind in the next one, I know it's still going to be attached to the rig. Now, the reason I've gone for the, the washed out approach is I often think that fish perhaps view bait that's been in the swim for 24, 40 hours with a little bit less caution, a little bit less suspicion. That's why I've washed it out. It's a lot of the flavours and attractors are have washed out and it's also much softer. I think at times, especially when carp are feeling a bit finicky, they can actually show favour towards a, a softer bait. The other bait I was using was the, the maize fished on a stack rig and that's going to the opposite end of the spectrum really. It's a very bright, very visual bait. So if the washed out approach doesn't, approach doesn't work, you've got this very, very visual hook bait there which might just snatch a bite. If there's a passing fish coming around to you, a little patch of yellow might just nick me a bite and that might make all the difference between success and failure. I've only gone and had one just before first light 
uh, rod absolutely ripped off and it was on a spot that I found in between the left hand margin and the island. Um, it was quite weedy out there. I had a few casts around with a bare lead and there was onion weed pretty much all down that channel. Um, but just casting around with a bare lead, I managed to find a spot, a clear spot, only small, um, I'm guessing literally a bin lid. Um, and the fact it was just this one clear area amongst all that weed suggests it was a, a, an area that the fish fed on or certainly visited. Um, and that's the spot that did it. I, um, it, caught, it came to the washed out hook bait, tipped off with a piece of maize. Um, and I put out a, a fair bit of bait actually last night. Um, and what I did there, I, I kind of uh, spotted out some, uh, some uh, soaked, washed out hybrid that I, I'd all mashed up in my hands, mixing with a little bit of corn. And uh, yeah, it did the biz. So I think what I'll do, I'll uh, have me porridge and then I'll show you my prize. Well, I never did get to finish me porridge. No sooner had we just spoken than the rod that I just got back out was away again. Oh, he's just trying to get under it. Oh, he's trying to get under the tree branches. I can feel it grating as well. Oh, oh he's out. No, he's not. There he is. I'm just gonna have to get down here. There's a little tiny bay off to me left that cuts in and he's gone right in there. He's not making it easy for me, is he? There he is, he's coming out now. That's not a bad fish at all. slowly waddling around like most of the decent fish do. I've got Lewis here to lend a hand with the net. Do not knock me out with that pole. There he is, Lewis. I think he's going to come up more than straight away here. Maybe not. Look at that. That'll do. Let's come up. Yep. Yeah. He'll do very nicely. Get in there. <laughs> High five. <laughs> Look at that. That's a unit. Right, where's my saddle? I'm taking him for a ride. <laughs> well, this is the fish we just landed. Lewis has got hold of the rod. Just claps the net down. Make sure that line's coming out there. Just roll the net up. Before you lift him out of the water, obviously check all his fins are tucked in tight to his body so they don't stick out and cause him any damage. Get your fin in. Just double check. He's still pretty angry actually. He didn't do with that much fighting, so he's going to be pretty lively, I think. There you go. Right then. Heave. That is a chunk, isn't it? That. Right, let's have a look at him. Well, he's absolutely nailed. Thanks to these line liner sleeved. Couldn't get a better hook hold than that. Inch and a half back, right in the middle of the bottom lip. Absolutely perfect. You can see there's the hook bait. The washed out hybrid in the armour mesh paste, tipped off with a little piece of maize. 
That's what did the damage. And this was the same rod that had the other fish on. He is an absolute chunk. Right. A little splash of water. I've got the waistling already zeroed. I wouldn't like to put a weight on that. I want to estimate it around 38. Thanks, Lewis. Right then. Let's see what he is. Well, I wasn't far off with my guess. 37.10. That'll do. How's about that then? Look at him. <laughs> Look at the shoulders on it. What a chunk. Well, this is the first fish I caught. It looks a bit small in comparison to the one you just saw me with, but it isn't, believe me. This one weighs 30 pounds, 10 ounces. So a brace of 30s, I'm absolutely over the moon with that. Doesn't get much better than that, does it really? Lovely, long, dark looking fish. I'm buzzing, what can I say? <laughs> right, I think I'll uh, put this one back and I'm gonna show you how I tie up my uh, meshed hook bait. I've just slipped that fish back with a change of clothes and a freshen up. So I think now is as good a time as any to show you how I tie up my meshed hook baits. Here we have the standard, normal hybrid boilies. Just as they are, not soaking. I've got these in an air dry bag. So, now we have the armour mesh. It looks a bit like PVA, but it isn't. It doesn't dissolve. We have the, the fine mesh, but it is similar in the PVA in, it, in, in that you construct it as you would a mesh PVA bag. All I've done there is simply tie a overhand knot in the end, pulled it down really tight and trim it with a pair of scissors. Slide down your boilie down the tube. Pull off a bit of the mesh and squeeze it all down tight. Get a bit of a twist as well. And then you just tie a simple overhand knot, again keeping it all as tight as you can, and push that knot right up against the bait. So you've got a really tight, tightly packed little parcel there. Just trim off the, the mesh there. And it's as simple as that. And here I've got some that have been soaking. These have been soaking for the same amount of time as, as my free offerings. And if I grab a normal bait as a comparison, you can see the difference in, in colour and size there. And as this bait has swelled up, the mesh has almost sunk inside the, the soft skin of the bait, so you can't even see the mesh at all. And the reason we use this mesh because obviously they've been soaking for two days, so they are very, very soft. And after two days, they might not withstand the attentions of, of small fish, such as roach or something, pecking away at it. And they may not withstand the casting as well, but the, the mesh solves all them problems. Now I've been fishing these in conjunction with, with maize. I've just been topping off the hook baits with a little piece of maize. Now, you may think, well, it's, it's bright yellow and it's kind of defeats the object of using a washed out bait. But the beauty of maize is it, it doesn't wash out. It's the same colour if it's been in the water for an hour or, or two or three days, it doesn't wash out. So for that reason, I think it goes really well 
with this washed out hook bait and it does add a little bit of a little bit of color a little bit of visual appeal to it and it's worked so far i've got one more night left of the session and i'm hoping it's going to work again well i've made my decision i've had a good walk around the lake now and there's quite a lot of fish just a couple of swims down from, from where I am at the moment. Um, it looks like they've been feeding there at some point through the afternoon as well, a few little patches of coloured water. I know a lot of people when they've had a couple of fish from a swim that'll be it, they'll think that's it, found the fish, I'll stay here. Well, the problem with fish, they've got fins, they can move, they can swim. Once you've had a couple, spooks the other fish in the area and they just move to somewhere else. I think that's exactly what's happened. I've only seen a couple of fish in the water in front of me today. So um, I'm going to pack the kit down, load it on the barrow and just uh, move at the bank and give this, this new area a go. the rod sorted for tonight you notice I'm only fishing two rods here the swim's actually really shallow it's only about three foot deep so my theory is more lines running through a shallow swim it might just create a bit of extra pressure too much pressure and the fish might just vacate and go to another area the third rod I've actually clipped it up on the productive spot from last night the peg a couple of swims down so if during the night I think the fish have left the area and they've gone back up the other end of the lake just in case of winding these other two rods in I'll just go down there, this rod's all clipped up, just in case of one cast back on that productive spot and you never know, that might make all the difference. So I think what I'm going to do now, I am going to get my house set up, then I'm going to order myself a big stinky kebab. it from me for this session last night looked really good for a bite but nothing happened at all really and I think that does kind of really emphasize this small water syndrome um, had them couple of fish yesterday and after that I think the fish became a lot more guarded although there was fish here last night they obviously knew they were being fished or they were a lot more aware and they just proved very uncooperative but to get two fish is a great result I mean the brace of 30s is even better but, I mean, there's been no other fish caught while we've been here. Um, in fact, in the past 10 days, there's only been three other carp caught. So, although I haven't caught any of the big ones, two fish on my very first session, I'm absolutely made up with that. Plus, it gives me something to come back for, because I've actually got my name down on the waiting list for this venue. So, hopefully, next year, I can get stuck into some of them really big fish. But, that's it for me for now. So, I'm going to uh, get myself loaded and hit the road, because I've got a long drive back. Thanks for watching, see you again. I probably spent a little bit too long stalking in an effort to try and get another bite, but I'm back in my swim now, the swim that I baited up earlier on, and the hook baits are back in position. I've seen a couple of fish, but I'm not getting any indicator activity, nothing to tell me that the fish are feeding out there yet. I suspect they'll probably do that tonight, and I'll let you know when they do. Now, we're moving into November and we're off fishing with Essex's favourite carp angler, Steve Spurgeon. He's on a days only venue and chod rigs are the order of the day. Right, well it's the 8th of November. 
I've just arrived in the car park of one of the Chelmsford Club Lake waters. Um, it's a day's only water. Uh, we're allowed on there at six o'clock in, in the morning. It's quarter two now, so it gives me enough time to get my barrel loaded. There's no one else here, so I've got pick of the swims. Obviously, I can't go and have a walk around and look for fish or anything, so I'm going to start off in a swim that I fished recently that does seem to be quite consistent. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my barrel loaded and get ready for six o'clock so I can go on the lake. Well, Rod's probably been out 20 minutes, something like that, and we're into fish already. So, real good result. Uh, I just walked around, baited out by the barrels there. Had a couple of little liners, and uh, first of all, I thought it was a bream, but it's clearly a carp the way it's going off now. So, what a good start to the day. really doesn't want to come in. Very deep out there. You've got a good, probably 14, 15 foot of water just out there. Where I'm actually fishing is about 17 foot of water. Well, just got a little glimpse of him then. His tail just hit the sock, but I still don't know. How big he is. Come on. There he is. Looks like a, I'd say, mid to up a double common, but he might even be a little bit better than that. It's not a bad fish, it's for sure. Whoa, and he's in. Lovely. All right, let's have a look. Yeah, I reckon he's about, yeah, Good, good mid-double, I reckon. We'll give him away anyway, and we'll see where it goes. Right, well, you can probably see from that, I've nailed him on a chod rig, which uh, I'll talk to you about a little bit more later, why I'm using it, etc. So if we get him unhooked, he's certainly nailed in the bottom lip, there's no doubt about that. Give it, uh, Oh, that wasn't coming out easy. Right, let's move that out of the way. Right, let's get it weighed up. Let's move that net out of the way. Right, my sling zeroed in. So we're ready to go with that. Lift it up in there. Sure that all fins are nice and flat. That's it. We'll do the zip up just to be on the safe side. Well, the more I look at it, it's looking a little bit bigger than I first thought it was, but all will be revealed. Right, let's get her up on the scales. Well, that's quite a shock. I didn't think it was as big as that. But that is weighing in at, I would say 23, I call it 2313. There we go. Nice little result. What a good start to the day. Well, there it is, 23 pound 13 ounces of common carp. Cracking start to the day, well pleased with that. Uh, what I'll do now is we get this back and then I'll talk you through my approach to the swim and uh, exactly what I'm doing out there. Okay, right, let's get her back. She's already wants to go. It's off. All right, I'll talk you through why I've chosen this swim. Firstly, you can see off to the right, there's a, a rope cutting across the lake, so it's creating a small out of bounds behind there. Now, the fish love to get behind there, so it's a real little sanctuary for them. Uh, it's a swim that's fished regularly, so it sees a lot of bait. Uh, the barrels out there are where I've put my left hand rod. Uh, again, it's an area that people fish all the time. The other, the other rod off positions, just up from the margin here, just before the rope actually cuts away, 
Uh, it's quite uniform uh, and it's deep out there, 17 foot. So you've got a shelf going away and then it just levels out. So with the other rod fished on the, uh, down the margin, it's on the shelf there, so it is in considerably shallow water than the one out by the barrels. As you've seen, I'm using chod rigs. Now, the reason I'm using chod rigs, uh, as you can see by the trees, there's probably been leaf litter going in the lakes now for about four weeks, and even you see them floating around on the surface here now. It's generally quite clear the bottom here, but the last thing, last thing I want to do is end up, you know, impaling a hook on a leaf, so a chod works brilliantly for that. Um, the other thing with the chod as well, it means if I do see fish show outside those baited areas, then I can cast it to it and I'm only using a small little lead, it's only an ounce and a quarter, so there's no disturbance whatsoever. Also, I know that I can retrieve that rod in, cast it out, and know there's no, no worry about a tangle, what it's landed on or anything, I know it'll be fishing effectively. Well, you've seen the spots I'm fishing, another advantage is I can walk around here and bait up by hand. Okay, so here's the second. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the actual main line I'm using. Uh, usually on a naked chod, most people use fluorocarbon, which I have done myself. Uh, this is actually Exocet, which is a distance casting line. Uh, now for me, this means that I can actually cast, this will cast far better than fluorocarbon. Uh, and unlike most distance casting lines, it actually sinks really well. So one, I can cast further, so I can get away with a real nice little light lead. Uh, it sinks and it's also super tough and it's 20 pounds. So I've got everything there, strength, durability, softness, and it casts, okay? So moving up from that, we've got a little tungsten bead on there onto one of our mainline sinkers. That just butts up on the back. So that stops my, my actual chod rig itself sliding any further up the main line. There's my actual hook length itself, my little chod rig, which I'll talk to you about more in a minute. Then going on down from there, got one of our heli buffer sleeves uh, and the beauty of these is they take the direct pressure of the swivel off the main line and as you can see it will drop down onto the actual sleeve itself so when you're actually playing the fish when that comes under tension it's not directly on the main line it's onto the actual rubber sleeve itself so that absorbs all that pulling and pressing and swinging of the lead okay right so from there, we better have a look at how this actual chod's tied up itself and what we're using to do that. Now, earlier in the DVD, you would have seen Lewis Porter land a 40 plus pound common on the uh, trans khaki rigidity, which is a new prototype material. Now, one of the things he requested was for a slightly stiffer, thicker material, which I'm fortunate enough, I've been using. So that's what I've got here and now, so I'm gonna tie a rig up with it. Now, because of it's very stiff, uh, and also it's, it's relatively thick, you can't do a normal knotless knot with this, so I'll have to do a whipping knot, which I'll show you how to do. But first of all, what I'm gonna do is tie on a size 11 ring swivel. Now again, because this is really thick and strong material, you can do a straightforward blood knot with this and not worry about losing breaking strain on it. Now, I know some of the other guys that have played around with this have done as little as a one turn blood knot. Now I'm just gonna take it through a couple of times. Pull down on that. Give it a nice little wet up, then give it a good tight pull. All right, again you can see, very small knot, but very safe and strong. So we trim that tag end off. Just gonna leave a tiny little bit on. It's probably only a couple of mil. Just cover that up cover the main knot up with my fingers and just give it a little bit of heat to the end of that. Make sure it's, that's it. Blob down tight, okay. I probably need about 10 inches of this just to be on the safe side to tie this rig up. So we cut that off. Now I'm using size five SR hook. This is obviously a stiff rigger hook. Nice in turn point on this, so once it goes in, it generally stays in. Very good hook. So, what we need to do now is pass that out towards the back of the hook. Now, this, the other beauty of this is you can actually tie these up, you know, nice and short. What we're going to do, we're going to form a loop 
like so, and just leave a bit of a tag end off, off there, and a small amount out the back like so. Okay, now what we need to do is take this big loop, and we're gonna whip down the shank. So we're gonna go back over that knot there, Bunch it up as you go, just push, keeping it up nice and tight. All right. Now from there, give it a nice wet up. All we need to do, slide the tag through. Like so. Give it a nice wet again before I pull it really tight. Okay. Now what I can do is slide that down back towards the eye of the hook. So just take your time with any knots. That's that. We can pull that down again and bunch it. And you can always already see it's taking shape. All right. Now one of the things I want to do is just manoeuvre that round so it's nice and straight, that tag end, because obviously you're going to form your D with that. Nice and straight at the back of the shank of the hook. Okay. Now all we need to do is slide a little her ring swivel on to the tag end. Now you're putting it through the actual ring part of the, the small swivel. Now we should, if we pull that back, we might have to cut a slight point to it, but hopefully we should be able to poke it through without trimming it too at all. There we go, we're through now. Pull that down. So we've formed our little loop on the back. Cut most of this tag end off. Probably got about four mil there at the moment. And again, using my fingers to actually protect the knot. Just, just burn and blob it. So take your time because it is important that you don't burn the uh, the hook length material itself. Okay, so that's the, the D form there now. Put that away. Now the beauty of this stuff, because it is so stiff, it's very easy to manipulate around to a nice little curve. There you go. Which is all you need for your chod. into the afternoon now. I haven't had any more fish. Obviously well pleased that I've had one just under 24 pound. Um, as it currently stands, it's, uh, it's raining, but we're gonna hang on because being a day's only water, often once it gets dark, it's a really good time for a bite on now. So we're gonna give it a little bit longer and see what happens. Well, this is horrible. I'm glad I stayed on. <laughs> well, it looks like holding on has paid off. I don't think I've got the biggest carp on in the world here, but nevertheless, it's another fish. So let's try and get him into the net. Well, there we go. Certainly paid on to hold on a little bit longer. Well, there you go. Not the biggest fish in the pond, but nevertheless, a welcome sight on a November's day. Uh, looks like it's paid to hold on anyway, just to stay into darkness. Uh, weather's not too nice. I'm pleased with my result. I mean, two fish, one just under 24 pound. Can't complain on, the, on a club ticket that costs you less than 70 pound a year. Pretty good fishing on November's day in my book, so. We get this one back. I'm going to sling the rod out just while I pack away. You never know. While the rods are in the water, there's always a chance of a bite. All right, let's get him back. 
<clears throat> it's now Tuesday morning and I am absolutely freezing. On Sunday, I was driving around in a t-shirt and shorts on my motorbike, bursting with confidence about the filming we were doing this week. However, yesterday morning, a northeasterly arrived and it is the most biting of winds I've felt in an awful long time. Despite the conditions, however, if you look behind me, there's a short-term retainer with a carp in it that I had a few minutes ago. So I'm going to go and get Harry the cameraman a cup of tea and stop him freezing to death too. And while we sort out this fish, I'll let you see the next session. It was coming up to Christmas last year and the lads at Fox decided a little vacation was in order. So they packed their bags and they headed off to the River Ebro in Spain. And word has it, they had an absolutely awesome session. We flew him to Barcelona Airport early today, a couple of hours drive to actually get to here. Uh, fortunately, it was still light when we arrived, so we managed to get a look down at the river. Uh, we saw, we, we've seen some fish show already, so, you know, fingers crossed. We'll know where they are for tomorrow morning. We'll get a nice early start, and hopefully we'll catch a few fish. This is where we're staying, so I'll take you in, and you can have a look around inside. Step this way. Right, it's got five twin rooms in here. So we've got a downstairs one, we've got a nice kitchen, we've got a toilet down here. Hey, up is Judith Charlie. Here we go, here's the living room. As you can see, all the lads are busy getting rigs tied and doing all sorts of manner of things. Fishy wise, that is, of course. All right, and then up the stairs, we've got. Another four bedrooms, one there, one there, one left and right, bathroom and shower. So, there you have it, nice little place. So I'm gonna get back down there, tie a few more rigs up, and we'll see you on the bank in the morning. Day one, we've been here for about an hour or so. We've just cast from the bank for now. Uh, our guide, Ash from Catmaster Tours, is back now. So he's brought the boat with him. So we're gonna get all the rods sorted and boat them all out. Uh, there's been a couple of guys on here, this area, for the last couple of days. This is, this is the Evo Point. Uh, they've done really well and they've had fish to over 40 pounds. So fingers crossed, we'll have a bit of the same action, a bit of luck. So let's get those rods out and get on with it. Well, it's taken a little while, but we are, we are into the first fish of the session. So, fingers crossed, this one hits the net. We're a long way out, so it's going to take me some while to get it back in. It's funny, we've just been seeing a few fish show out there. And uh, the bites come from that area. Yes, Stephen. Come on. I'm the old spurgeonator. Is it true you didn't use the bait boat for this? Uh, well, <laughs> not a remote control one anyway. Just trying to keep it away from Tom's lines. Yeah, they're pumps, baby. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the guns are up. <laughs> well, the fish is getting in close now. Andy's going to get down there with a the net to try and net. I'm going to stay up here because we've got a, a real drop off on the shelf there. So I need to keep the line up and away from that. I've got a heavy leader on anyway, just in case, but we're just going to play it safe. 
he's working his way over the top of the shelf at the moment. Well done, Mr. Maker. Hey! Well, hey! hey. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's off me. <laughs> you alright, Ed? Right. Cheers, mate. <laughs> you alright? Well done, Ed. Well, there it is. First one of the trip. Not the biggest Debro carp, but a fish nevertheless. Nice double there. You can see how long he is, the size of his fins. Can you imagine one of them at £40 plus? But that'll do for a start anyway. Let's get him back. It feels absolutely enormous. Right, we've just seen Steve have one. It's my turn now. Uh, fishing quite a long way out, so they do take a bit of time to get them in. Oh, and uh, this one's kited around to the right a bit, which is quite, it's quite a snaggy area, so you've got to keep the rod up in the air, keep it coming in. The leader knot's just coming in now, so I'm going to concentrate because I can see a shape and it's quite big. Uh, yeah. So, let's see what we can do. But this is extreme fishing. <laughs> it looks absolutely massive. It's huge. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, it's a it's a, tw it's a 20, it's a good 20, it might be bigger. Well, I've just been told it's only a 20. It's not a good 20. <laughs> <laughs> My heart's going like proper. It's getting close now. First fish from a new water well, a river. So, uh, trying to get it in. So deep down in front, when they, uh, when they come in, all they're trying to do is just hook back over the shelf and trying to shed the hook as much as they can. So just keep the pressure on, keep the rod up. Got a braided leader on anyway, so that'll take most of it. Should. Uh, should it rub on rocks? There he is, look. Oh, -ho. <laughs> that's a bad boy coming, isn't it? <laughs> ain't a mid 20, that, I know. <laughs> is it? That ain't a mid 20. Come on, Ash. Right, weeds on my line, so I've got to walk back. Louis going to net it, the first he broke up. Oh, yeah. Lou? Lou? Yes! Hey. Yes! <laughs> That's awesome. Cheers, right, Steve. <laughs> Sally, all this way, tipped it off with a bit of plastic, fantastic. <sighs> well, there it is, the first river he broke up. All 30 pound 12 ounces of it really hard fighting and you can tell you can see why size of the fins on these they really are built for the river give me a bit of grief in the margin but nice big hook we got it in awesome right i'll just talk you through the hook length arrangement i'm using starting off with the the, uh, the swivel end as you can see there's a loop there so i use that to a quick change swivel anti-tangle sleeve and there's about 10 inches of Cortex there in 35 pound in the matte brown finish. Uh, going down to that, you can see it's slightly stripped there for a little bit of movement. Nothing fancy, nothing too sophisticated. I've got a liner liner on sleeve there just to kick it out. Uh, on the hook front, we're all using big, strong hooks. Uh, this is a Curo S1 in a size two, so super strong. We're using uh, between us uh, XSCs, uh, SSBPs, but again, big sizes, big hooks strong and that is the uh, order of the day on here. What I've done here, obviously we're using pre dual pellets, these are large 22 mil ones and I've topped it off with half a pop up there. To keep that from moving around because obviously the hole in the pellet is big, I've just cut down a piece of anti-tangle sleeve and uh, pierced that on the hair and that stops that obviously rattling around on there and moving about. So again simple, strong and just effective, it will just turn every time and nail them. So there it is.
Oh, you're in, mate. Go on, son. <laughs> he might cheer up now. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit sorry for myself today because I've got quite a bit of flu on and I've been coughing a lot and uh, so I apologise now if I cough whilst I'm talking to you but uh, yeah so it's been quite a slow morning and then Steve and Tom have both had fish in quick succession which picked the morale up quite a bit and uh, just having a bite to eat and contemplating whether to redo my rods for the afternoon. And, uh, yeah, my left-hand rod has uh, just registered a drop back, a real savage drop back. I'm using eight-ounce inline leads, and they're coming off right on the take. So uh, it's, it's, the lead's ejected straight away. It's given me a big drop back. I've just wound up the slack and lifted into the fish. So a <clears throat> bit of pressure here because Tom's just said it looks massive, which is always helpful when you hooked your first fish of a trip for the camera. Oh, <laughs> Does look alright. Um, got Mr. Spurgeon on the net waiting. Nice, nice Ebro common. Leads off. Big mouth. Big pellet hanging out. Come on, Spurgey, get it in the net, baby. Go on, Spurgey, get it under the net. That's in. That's in. That's in. Come on! <laughs> well done, Lewis. <laughs> well done, mate. It's a fat one. <laughs> Suddenly I feel a little bit better and my flu doesn't feel anywhere near as bad. Right, let's lift her up and sh show her to the cameras. <laughs> Angry, dorsal up, tail kicked around. Come on. Straighten yourself out. Come on. Here we go. That is one angry Ebro river fish. 38 pounds of pure fighting machine. First fish for me of the trip, third one of the day. You know, it is important to stress we're, we're fishing as a team, all four of us on this session. We're helping each other out with positioning the rods, landing the fish, the weigh-in, everything. You know, we're all watching the water and tipping each other off when we're seeing fish show so it's nice to uh, be involved with this and enjoy this sort of fishing in, in the middle of December it's Christmas in only a few days time and that's the best Christmas present you could ask for awesome let's get her back <laughs> So, put the 38 pound common back and uh, now getting the rod back out in position. As you can see, I'm on, on the land holding the rod. Mr. Spurgeon is effectively my human bait boat. Go left! Um, Mr. Spurgeon is my human bait boat. There's a spot out at about 150 yards that I found earlier in the session. And uh, as Steve's a, a more competent rower than what I am, and prefers to be on the water more than I do. He's uh, tasked with the uh, p job of putting the rigs back out on the money, so he's just <coughs> battling against the wind and uh, rowing it back out there. Yeah. Bit further! <laughs> so Steve's just getting uh, close to the area now where, where that fish came from. He's uh, simply going to just position the uh, the lead and the PVA bag of pellet over the side of the boat. He'll shout me to let me know he's ready to drop. I'll fill it down and tighten it up and get it back, back on the buzzer. Right, Steve's just got to uh, to the spot. He's going to now get me to tighten my line up so that we're, it's off the surface and directly to the boat. He's then going to lower the rig over the side with a PVA bag of some pellets. And he'll chuck about... Ready? 
who chuck a couple of handfuls of pellets over the top. We're not fishing with loads of free bait. We're acting on the, the advice of Ash and Colin who run the fishing out here for Catmaster and they're saying literally just a couple of handfuls of pellets at this time of year. So that's how we're, that's how we're fishing and it's got us free bites so far today so we can't grumble. And just tightening it up, I'm using an eight ounce lead and you can really, really crank down tight, taking all the stretch out of the mono because the flow on this river is so strong at times when the dam's open, it, uh, it can put a real old, old bow in your line. So we really cranking it down and taking every little bit of stretch out of the line, pulling it da right down tight to that eight ounce Klingon lead. I'm fishing with a very tight clutch as well because if, if the clutch is too loose with the flow, picking up on your line, <clears throat> it will just tick line off the spool and your line will end up upstream and you'll just be getting loads of bleeps and poor indications. So we're cranking it down as tight as we can. Got these swingers with the weight as set to its heaviest setting as well. So it's all about putting as much tension on this line as possible. So as soon as the fish picks up the rig, we get some indication. And what happened on that bite is it's picked up the rig shake of the head, the inline lead drop off systems work to treat, the lead's off, that's then given me a load of slack line because the stretches then all come out of the line like a coiled spring. I had a really savage drop back, got to the rod, wound up the slack, made contact with the fish and uh, for me that's perfect way of fishing on, on this river and, and maximising the bite indication with the setup that we've got. So the alarm's on and we're fishing, Steve's making his way back to shore. We've got about a couple of hours of light left. We're going to fish on until about six, seven o'clock this evening. So hopefully day one will finish with a 40. But hey, if we don't get a bigger one, we're happy, that's for sure. You're in, Steve. Yeah, yeah he's in. <laughs> well, <laughs> Mr. Spurgeon has literally <laughs> just got back to the shore <laughs> in the boat having dropped my rod. And he's rods away. You're right there, Steve. You're yeah. sound a little bit out of breath. <laughs> I've just run back. Do we have a registered first aider on Ebro Point? As you can see, Steve is about 20 yards further up the bank than where he was, where his rods was positioned when he took the fish. And that's because these fish, quite often when they're hooked, they just go up with the flow of the river upstream. So he's uh, buddy up the rods. So far, so good. He hasn't taken me or Tom out. Still a chance that he might take Andy Maker out. <laughs> just got to go with the flow. Yeah. <laughs> you do have to go with the flow, Tom. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, hello. Uh, it's another small fish. Yeah, it's another small fish. Steve has unfortunately <laughs> hooked another small fish, uh, a yak mandu, as they are known in this part of Spain. <laughs> Stocked by a man from Katmandu. <laughs> Teamwork this. One minute. There you go. Get the net down, Luke. <laughs> what do you reckon, Luke? Good 20, innit? Yeah, I. Uh, it's not as big as my fish. No. <laughs> Obviously. Of course it isn't. But as we are a team, you know, I think that's yeah. a great team result. Boom. Well, there you go. It's number four for the team for the day. It's £31. Proper gnarly looking river carp. It looks like I've seen a bit of action and been batting around a few times this one, but still, nice fish to catch. And a river e row PB for me, so. Get a few photos of her, get her back. Still time for one or two more for the team, yeah? Great. Well, day one's come to a close on the fishing front. We've had a good first day. We've had four fish between us. Uh, up to just over £38 and uh, three thirties in total, so 
we're more than pleased with that. Hopefully, day two will be just as good. So we're going to get out now and have a meal in the local town. So we'll see you on the bank tomorrow, first thing, bright and early. Well, it's day two, we're back in the points room on the Ebro. Uh, we managed to get the rod sorted a little bit better today than we did yesterday. It was a little bit of a disaster at start. But um, today it's all been all gone to plan. I've been out there a couple of hours and uh, I'm fortunate enough to get the first bite of the day. So, fingers crossed, it's a good one. It's a 20 pounder anyway. It's a 20 pounder, isn't it? It's a 20 pounder, isn't it? <laughs> there you go. Here we go, look. Ready, Mr. Maker? Yeah, yeah. Go on, Steve. 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 Yes. Oh, well done, Ed. From one old timer to another. Look, there you go. The ground from Mars, isn't it? Come on, man. It's all kicking off. It's all kicking off. You got right, some. <laughs> It's really hard, isn't it, to get up and down? Steve's just had one, so it uh, looks like it could be all kicking off this morning. There's fish showing everywhere. Yeah, keep it under plenty of pressure. Not so much flow this morning either. Oh, he's got a double bite! Come on! <laughs> yeah, it is a double, yeah. Go on, mate, have it, yeah. It's taken about 15 minutes, but we've managed to pull this one in from about 200 yards. And while I was playing it, the other rod's gone off as well. Tom's got one as well. That's three bites on the trot. Yeah, it is Tom. Well, I just said we had. Uh, I've just had a double bite. So while Tom's playing, uh, playing the fish on my other rod, he's actually got a bite as well. Ah! Oh, all hell's breaking loose. Who said about eight runs going off? <laughs> right, moving on from the uh, the triple bite, Lewis has now got a uh, carp on, hence the camera's come out the water now and out the boat, because we've got rods going off everywhere and we're a tad short-handed in the uh, net to run ratio at the moment, but this is awesome, absolutely awesome. Go on, son. She's in. Has it got your other lot? You got one on there? Oh, Christ, yours is ripping. How's that? Over you go, sunshine. That guys. <laughs> Here we go, look. On the Ebro, it's kicking off this morning. Spent all day yesterday for four fish. So far, we've got veteran of carp angling, Steve Spurgeon. He's just had a 30. My dad, he's had a double take, he's got two. I've just landed one. And if you look behind me, the, uh, the big man that is Al Potter, he's into one as well. So, we're having it. We've got some absolute chaos going off here. I'm sure the other guys have probably already explained what's gone on, but we've had four takes in about five minutes. It's just chaos. 
I was actually rowing the boat out a little bit with the cameraman in so he could get some really nice shots looking back at the swim of, of Andy playing the fish. Then Andy had another bite, so Tom's playing that one. Then Tom's had a bite, and then I've had a bite. So we've had to quickly get back onto the shore and uh, get the rod and the fish, which is now snagging me solid on the shelf. I need the boat again. Steve, need the boat. Yeah. The fish, which has absolutely run me ragged. I've already had to get in the boat to nip round the side of a tree that's on the point because the fish had gone down the flow so much. And it's 10 yards from the bank, has gone solid on a, something on the shelf, I'm guessing. There's no point trying to pull its head off now. Steve's going to just nip the boat back round and we'll go out on the boat and see if a different line angle will free, free it from the shelf. I could make myself look really silly here because it it feels massive and it's it's run me ragged. And if if this turns out to be a small fish, then full credit to these Ebro fish because they are obviously uh, a different creature to the lake fish that we play back in England. Um, it feels really big and uh, yeah, I'm hoping we can get it in. very annoying. Well, unfortunately, I uh, lost the fish out to the snag, put the rod down on the, on the buzzer for 20 minutes, but nothing gave, and in the end, managed to put some pressure on it and uh, it gave way, but luckily I managed to get the rig back so the fish isn't left trailing any line, which is good. The boys, however, they managed to get their fish in, and uh, a couple of them are really special. Tom's is proof that the Ebro future is nice and secure, but first up, Tom's dad, also known as Andy Maker. How big was this one, And? 36 pound on the nose, mate. First ever Ebro carp, yep. 36 pound. Well chuffed. Tom's, nice little double there. And Mr Spurgeon on the end, 34 pounds, five ounces. It's only 10 days until Christmas. And if ever there was proof of some fantastic fishing and the service on offer from Catmaster Tours, this and the action we've had this morning speaks volumes. Right, well, as you can imagine, fishing a river of this size, the, uh, the conditions are pretty harsh. Where our hook baits are, 35 foot deep, just off the rod tips there, we've got a really steep shelf. Pretty similar to what I'm sitting on here. Um, Basically, we're using two lines of attack. Lewis is using the inline drop-off setup purely because his leads are eight ounces and that's all he's got. So he's got the larger lead, inline drop-off. What that does, as you'll all know, the bung comes out of the end. That then allows the insert at the top to pull free and the lead's free. So perfectly safe way of fishing, but with a larger lead. Um, on to, moving on, the lead arrangement that me, Dad and Steve are using is a traditional lead clip. We brought five ounce grip of lead. That's perfectly all right when there's not a lot of flow, but with it being a hydro dam during the course of the day when people are using electricity, the water starts flowing. So this lead clip allows us to change and put two five ounce should the flow pick up. Um, as I said, you can see that the, both of the systems drop the lead with the, uh, with the shelf that we've got in front of us. Uh, you don't want to be, be losing fish on the shelf. There's no excuse to be losing fish. One thing just to mention, although we've got mono line on, the shock leaders that we're using are armadillo, which is a braid. So should they rub on the shelf, you've got a lot more, uh, lot more abrasion resistance on the braid, so the fish are, are up and they're free. And you've probably seen every fish we've landed hasn't had the lead attached, and we've had no problems at all. So they're the lead setups we're using. Hopefully they carry on and we get a few more. Oh! Oh! He's only gonna go the biggest thing. 
the trip. 39 2. 39 2. Hey! Well, that's not far off, mate. Well done. Just way. Just tipped him. Hooray! Okay, this is the third fish of the day. Uh, best fish of the day as well. It goes 39 pound, two ounces. Had it on a uh, halibut pellet tipped with a half a pineapple pop up. A method that uh, Steve used yesterday to great success. So uh, we put the troubles of yesterday behind us and uh, we're all fishing far more effectively now. And I think this is, uh, this is the 11th fish of the trip now. So it's all going well. thrown out there to uh, reposition one of Tom's rods. The fish has started showing slightly more to the right, so we're going to uh, we're going to reposition his right-hand rod. Um, and if you can see, I've got the lead and the rig trapped in my boot. The hook link and the PVA bags in the bucket with the free offerings. That's the signal from Tom. This is where he wants to put his bait. We'll just remove the the rig from the foot. Right flow's picked up slightly now so we're just going to clip an extra lead on quite a long way out probably a couple of hundred yards out here so we're just going to fix another lead on there just push the clip on see the PVA bags ready to go we'll just straighten ourselves up a bit Right, tighten it up. Right, just lower this over the side. Right, it's away. Just literally ten pellets scattered, maybe a dozen in the area. Like I say, we're only after one bite. And that's, that's more than enough for December to get out of one bite. Okay, let's go back to the bank. Right, this is a uh, wait a while for this one after an early bite, but uh, it looks like another good fish. It's got in that flow. That's been hard work getting it back. Probably hooked it about 200 yards out, but it really is having a go. Just over the other side of the uh, shelf now, keeping him high up in the water there. Oh yeah, that's a good fish. It's a good fish. <laughs> that is a unit. That's nice, Steve. Yeah, that's nice. That we, we like that. Certainly fought harder than anything else I've looked so far, so. Oh, he's right near that ledge. Just gonna get round. I'm trying to get around here, mate, because it's right down by that ledge. Look, I'm trying to. Go on, it. Go on, hand. Get it in, mate. That's a, that is a lump, mate. Get it in. Get it in. Go on. Go on. Yes, mate. Woo! <laughs> That's a chunk, mate. Hey, Parker. Woo! Oh man, blowing away, what a fish! No idea at the moment, it's looking, oh, it looks mid 40. Yeah, looking at that, it's much bigger than I was expecting. I mean, it felt a chunk on there, but even I wasn't expecting that. I thought it was going to be another 30. But, right. Oh, 
What a beast! And that is proper made the trip for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go for it. Moment of truth, Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. What is it? 44. Two. Four pounds, two ounces. Woohoo! Four, two ounces. Oh, man. <laughs> well, well, well pleased with that. Well. Next trip to the sport, is it? Come on, the old ones. <laughs> what did Tom say? Go on, get a 40. Well, look at that, 44 pound plus. I mean, we've had a great trip already. We knew these fish were in here. I don't think any of us really expected to catch one like this. We've had some fantastic action already, but this just made the trip, just blown away. Fantastic, you just don't care if you catch anything after you catch them like this. Brilliant. Woohoo! Cheers again, mate. Oh, wicked. Wicked cheers, Ed. <laughs>well, this might be the last one of day two. We've only got about an hour left now, but what a day it's been. All of us have had action. Andy's finished it here by looks of things with a 38 pounder. It's really one for the veterans today. We've showed those young guns how to do it because you can't buy experience, can you, Ed? You can't. So there you go. You what a day. Roll on day three. Cracking. It's day three, and it looks like day three's uh, starting like we ended day two with fish. So we've probably had the rod to the water about an hour. We've got them boated out in the dark. It's just getting light now, or it is just light. And uh, yeah, I'm playing this one. And uh, hard to say they'll feel good in, out in the river, but uh, it certainly feels like it's a reasonable size. I've never actually used these rods before, before coming out here. These are the, the 13 foot three and a half warriors, but I've been so impressed with them. They're lovely for playing fish under the tip. You could do get, seem to get that extra bit of cushion with that extra foot. Ain't too shabby, is he? Well done, Lou Dog. Get him in there. Woo hoo! First one of the day on day three. So you mean you got a cat on, mate? Well, either that or, or the Abraham <laughs> Cup have uh, had their weight of mix this morning. That's just that's the first one I've really seen pulling back. At that range? Yeah. I don't know, what do you reckon? Yeah. And he's in as well. Mr. Maker's in over my shoulder there. Mr. Maker, that's know. a great CV programme too. Oh, that's, right. that's a carp, mate. I was really confident of a bite on this spot. When we were dropping it earlier, I turned to you, didn't I, Steve? Yeah. said, that's on the dance floor. Yeah, without a doubt. He said, that looks good, actually, on the dance floor, didn't you? Yeah. I did see a few <laughs> carp. And you said to me, I, I remember you saying to me, Steve, you went, <laughs> said, I bet you look good on the dance floor. I did, I did. Yeah, look, there's one just cut and move on the floor now, look. Yeah. <laughs> 
he said, I bet you look good on the dance floor, but you don't know what you're looking for, Phil. didn't you? <laughs> I'm looking for an Ebro Carp, Steve. Look, yeah, I'm looking for a 44. That's away. Go on, look, it's exactly like yesterday, isn't it? Crank it up. Well, the same as yesterday morning, around nine o'clock, it has kicked off to some tune. Um, Lewis's one is £37, uh, my one's just under £31. It has been absolute carnage. Um, Tom, who's chosen the casting route, we're all doing ours by boat, but he's chosen to cast his rigs out, has got an absolute stunning common, a very, very large fish in the sack as we speak. Um, These fish are mental. Absolutely. Look at them. Absolute stunners. Size of the Daryl Pecks on this absolute machines. They run you ragged. It's That's awesome fishing. <laughs> I, I'm coming back. Yeah, if I'm you, coming. If you want to get winter action, come to the Ebro. Come with Catmaster Tours because there ain't nothing better out there. It's awesome. And believe you me, you don't have to be as young as him to catch them. <laughs> me and Steve have cracked it, mate, and we're still standing. <laughs> Get on the Ebro. Let's get these back and find out how big Tom's is, because it's even bigger than these. <laughs> it's bigger than these. It's 40, yeah. mate. <laughs> yeah, 43. Hang on, hang on. Five. Uh, it looks about... 43.5. It looks 43.5. I'll go along that's what it's yeah. settled on. Yeah. 43.5, okay. mate, yeah. It's three times it's settled down, it's 43.5. It's ever common. Well done, Tom. Well done, again, mate. Awesome. Proper. <laughs> there you go, then. For those of you that aren't that confident using the boat, this fish here, I had a couple yesterday, just chucking single pellets to show him fish. I know it's a massive river, 600 yards wide. And you give it your biggest cast and it looks like it's going nowhere but this just proves that by casting about the fish are still there to be caught this one as well biggest ever common i've had 43 and a quarter absolutely over the moon and as we keep saying only 10 days till christmas so what more can you ask for awesome I've got, I've got a good fish on here. I mean, we've only been fishing a few hours. This has been the ninth one between us this morning. So it's really got off. Uh, at the moment, there's fish weighing in, in slings, nets, just gone mad. So, But this is without doubt the hardest fighting one I've hooked since I've been here. I've had it in close already a few times. It's been up and down the shelf there. But there, oh, it's a good fish. Certainly looks at least a high 30. Man, it just don't want to give up. It's got to be getting tired now. Got to be. Here we go. Come on, Gil. Call it a day. Yeah, we're not quite ready, it's getting there. Definitely a high 30, I would say, mate. Well done, Tom. Nice one, mate. Whoo! Hey! <laughs> yeah, nice fish. Whew. 
That's made me up. It's made me arms ache. Unit. Massive. It's got to be 47, 48. <laughs> Man, that, that is a serious unit. It's gutty as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's deep. Barrel, isn't it? Look at that. It's going to beat me up a bit, this one, I think. Wider than your wallet, that one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> What a mint fish as well. He's gonna beat me up I reckon. Yeah. 47. Oh. 48. <laughs> no. 48. Shows, yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. 48, 3, 4, 3, 5, 3, 4. 48, 4. Well, hey, Brilliant. Steve. Oh, Brilliant. Steven. Cheers. Run the old boy. Come on. Run for the old ones. <laughs> well, I was blown away yesterday. I'm even more blown away today. Again, a bit lost for words. What a fish. What a scrap as well. It's fought harder than any of the others. Started to come in quite easy at that range, but I got it in within about 30 yards and it just didn't want to know. It stayed deep. All the others had hit the surface after dumping the lead. So I thought it was going to be something a little bit better, but again, I wasn't expecting that. What a fishing trip it's been. Can't wait to come back. There you go, 48 pound four ounces of Ebro common carp. I was blown away yesterday. It was a PB common yesterday at 44. This one is obviously bigger, but it's also a PB full stop. So again, blown away, what a trip. <sighs> Fantastic. There she goes. Whew. Chunk. Fantastic. Right, if you can see behind me, Tom's into yet another carp on this fantastic trip. Uh, I'm just going to sort you through the hardware that you, uh, you need and you get supplied for the trip. First of all, the pod, um, you get supplied with the pod. Uh, the only reason for the pod is the, the rock hard ground, far better than the bank sticks, much more sturdy. Uh, the rods are supplied, uh, the alarms, backrests. Uh, basically all you need to bring is, uh, is your reels and your terminal tackle. Um, reels of your choice, as long as they hold enough, enough line. 15, 16, 18 pound lines fine. Uh, like I say, you've got to bring your terminal tackle. Lead sizes, four to six ounces I would suggest. If you bring the fours, you can always double up on them should the, the flow pick up. Um, that's about it really, everything else is supplied. This looks like it's going to be the last fish of the trip. 34 pound of a bar of gold there from the Ebro for Tom Maker. It's been absolutely fantastic. We've had 25 fish now between the four of us and 14 of them have been over 30 pound up to 48 pound. So we couldn't have asked for any more. The help we've had has been fantastic. The guiding has been fantastic. Obviously a lot of you guys are going to want to know how you get out of here. Colin Bunn runs the trips here for Cat Master Tours and Colin will tell you exactly what you need to do. Colin. Alright, yeah all you need to do is contact us via the website or give us a call and uh, we can arrange everything for you. Just turn up, all the tackle supplied pretty much and uh, come out and give us a try and see what you can catch. Well, well one, one thing I would like to do before we end this, Ash if you could just come into shop. Yeah. Come on Ash into shop. Come on Ash. Come on, Ash. <laughs>
<laughs> right, we all need to give Ash a really big thank you because the man's been an absolute man. legend. <laughs> right, he really has helped us out on this trip. So, Ash, thanks very much, mate. Cheers, Ash. Morning, it's been an absolute right, pleasure, mate. It's been a pleasure to meet all of you. Well done for you, mate. Thank you very much. Hopefully, Fantastic. hopefully we'll awesome. be back again next year. Well, what an incredible trip and unbelievably the lads went back to the river on the morning before the plane took off to come back to the UK and Steve caught himself another couple of 40 pounders. It really is the stuff of dreams. And while we're talking of dreams, <laughs> I caught myself a car up this morning uh, in the most appalling conditions. It really is a horrible easterly wind. Be that as it may. I've caught myself an absolutely stunning Hollybush Lakes carp. Uh, these fish are so old, but I can't think of a better example of a classic English carp. Now, moving on beyond Christmas, Mark Pitchers was away doing his monthly 20s challenge, and he was at Fendland Fisheries Willow Lake. And when he got something a little bit more than he bargained for, he was on the phone quickly to Harry Charrington at Fox HQ and Harry got down there with his cameras to record what was an incredible January result. Well, it's the 14th of January and you join me here at Finland Fisheries Willow Lake in Cambridgeshire. I'm actually here to shoot my Total Carp 20s challenge. Um, I got down late yesterday. Uh, weather's very, very cold. We enjoyed quite a mild January, but these past few days the temperature's really taken a tumble. Um, woke up this morning, there was a really harsh frost on the ground. Wasn't really confident at all, if I'm honest. But shortly after dawn, the rod ripped off and I managed to catch something a little bit special. Um, so special, in fact, I decided to give Harry, the cameraman, a call. He was working just down the road, so he's flown over. Um, so he's going to get everything uh, on camera and I think we should now go and take a look at what we got. Well, Cambridge has been very kind to me. You saw me earlier in the DVD with that uh, brace of 30 pounders I caught from the, whilst on a, a guest session on a, on a Cambridge syndicate. And I've only gone and done it again. Have a look at this. This is 36 pound, three ounces of lively, January mirror carp. Come on. There he is. I was like that for a, an old looking warrior. One of the original fish in the lake. I'm absolutely made up with this. I can't express how happy I am right now. One of the biggest carp I've caught in January actually. And it's also the biggest carp I've caught live for a, for a magazine feature. Ah, oh, look at that. Caught this fish on, uh, on Maggot Tactics uh, using a variety of new products that I'm very lucky to be testing out. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to let the total lads get all the photos they need. Then I'm going to pop him back and then we'll take a look at my approach in a bit more detail. Well, I mentioned earlier that I've been fishing with maggots and this is the rig I've been using to present a hook bait over the top. You'll see I've got a, a disc of pink artificial maggots there and they're fished on top of a 10 mil milky toffee pop-up. Now the hook bait's presented on my variation of a hinged stiff rig. We have a size 6 armour point 
SR hook and that's tied to 25 pound rigidity and then that's attached to a tiny size 11 flexi ring swivel and tied to that we've got 15 pound Camotex soft hook link. But the main bit of kit I want to talk about is this new running rig setup here. Now you'll see it comprises of two main components. We have the, the running bead itself um, and that, with that I'm using a heavy size 4 ounce lead. And it's important to use as heavy lead as possible um, because you want the line to be able to slide freely. If you use a smaller lead, the lead can sometimes move or dislodge and the line doesn't run freely enough through the bead. And this lead is attached to the clip by a small plastic peg. Now there's also the option, you can actually use a PVA tie as well which comes as part of the kit. So if you're fishing in weedy or snaggy situations where you want the lead to be able to discharge on the take then that gives you that option. But where I'm fishing out there there's no snags, there's no weed so I've just got the lead fixed in place. You see as the lead slides down it fits over this rubber grommet and you'll see it's angled so that the lead sits very neatly like that. It almost sits like a, a helicopter setup and it casts very well indeed. And inside the rubber buffer bead I just have a quick chain swivel just to allow me to change my hook link more easily. Now the reason I've chosen to use a running rig on here is Willow is a, a very pressured day ticket water and I assume that the majority of anglers come here fi fish some sort of semi-fixed lead setup either a lead clip or an inline lead and this running lead just gives the fish something something different something they're not used to dealing with when they sort of pick up the hook bait and tighten up to, to a lead normally they're not getting that same sensation as they tighten up the line's running freely and it's giving me an indication straight away so I just hope that gives me a little bit of an edge on what is a very pressured day ticket venue Well I've got the rods fished on two different spots. The first spot I found was out towards the centre of the lake. Um, it's all sort of silty and choddy. As I was pulling the lead back I just felt a very very faint tap of gravel. Almost as if that, that area had been recently fed on and they just cleared away the, the top few layers of sediment to reveal the, the gravel underneath. So I've got two rods fished on, on, on that spot. And the second spot I found was quite sort of by accident really. Just having a cast around with a marker float. And when I pulled the lead back I just felt it clatter into a fish, I just felt the rod just, just judder away. So, I mean, a sign like that, it either can't be ignored. So I popped up the float and that's, that's had about half a gallon of maggots put on top of it. Um, and actually, actually, that was the spot that produced my fish. Um, but this is the actual mix I'm using. I say I'm using maggots. Uh, this was kind of three quarters full. Um, all it is is just maggots and in, in mix in amongst them, you can see I've got a few 10 mil hybrid boilies as well. That's all it is, nothing complicated at all. So I've just redone the rods, rebaited them, give a bit of a, bit of a top up. Um, looks like it's going to be another cold night, but fingers crossed we can have a, a fish to show for you in the morning. Well, this is a proper turn up for the books. We were just getting stuck into a nice Indian, and I get a weird, twitchy little take. So I walked down the rods casually, picked it up and met with a very little resistance. The cameraman says to me, do you want me to get the camera roll? And I says, no, don't worry about it mate, it's just a bream. It didn't even feel like a big bream. This thing just came in, all the way in, just literally just wound it in. And next thing, up pops a carp, ready to be netted, first time of asking. Just, just splashing around underneath my feet. Couldn't believe it, from, from getting the bite to landing it was seconds. And the tag, like I say, was very, very twitchy. Um, and I think it just goes to show with that running rig, I think this carp may have just been sat there trying its best to eject the rig, sucking and blowing. And the running rig, because it has that extra movement, it was just transmitted back instantly. So it may have been a case that I wouldn't have had that bite or, or noticed that bite as early as I did if I'd have been using a, a semi-fixed lead setup. But I'm absolutely buzzing. This is a decent fish. So we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna secure the net in place then we're going to have a weigh and uh, see what the old magic number is. 
<sighs> and here he is, almost a 30. <laughs> a 29 pound 13 ounce mirror that I thought it was a bream. He certainly had me convinced he was a bream. Right up until the point I put the net under him. I, um, <laughs> I thought I was spoilt this morning when I caught that 36 pounder. But to get two fish of this sort of size in January, I'm, I'm just blown away. Especially to catch them live for a magazine feature. It really does, it's just the icing on the cake. But there's, uh, well, there's a tonight to go yet, so you never know. I might just do that brace of 30s, but if not, I can't really complain, can I? Just give him a couple of seconds just to get his breath back. Not that he needs it, he didn't exactly do any fighting on the way and he shouldn't be tired. He looks a lot bigger in the water. There you go, you can see where you're going now. Off he waddles. He's having a bit of a sulk. Oh! Well, I had to turn up for the books. <laughs> Just stood next to the rods. Might look a bit staged, but I can assure you it isn't. I was just stood next to the rods, bobbing wax up to the top, and I'm now playing what will hopefully be my third carp of the session. Same rod again. Um, the other two rods that I found on that, that I put on that nice sort of uh, gravelly patch in among the silt, they have done nothing. And it's that same rod, the rod where I wound that marker float over a fish, and then popped it up. It's that same rod that's doing all the business. Well, the last time you saw me, I had that nearly 30 pounder, and I was dressed like I was going on an Arctic expedition. But since then, through the night, the cloud cover came in, and it has warmed up massively. It doesn't even feel like winter, it just feels like a, a mild autumnal day, to be honest. All right, what have we got going on here? So it's gone over that line and under that line. Okay. Uh, it's a little scaly one. Not as big as I thought. I'm not moaning. It's a pretty fish. Here he comes, lovely scaly fish. He's in the net. I was about that for a result. He's not as big as the other two, but he's definitely the best looking fish of the session so far. Lovely scaly fish, that one. Very nice. Let's go and have a look at him. Well, what a fish to cap off what has been a very, very memorable January session. He might be the smallest one of the trip, just over 17 pounds, but what a stunner. It had me fooled though, I thought this was a chunk coming all the way in. Um, I think these fish have got sort of uh, identity issues. First one I caught I thought might have been a catfish, second one I thought was a bream, this one I thought was a unit. But I am far from disappointed, I mean just look at it. What an absolute perler. <laughs> well, I think I've got about an hour of my session remaining so I'm going to slip this fella back, get the rod back out for the final hour and you never know, I might just have a chance of uh, one more bite yet. Just cast the rig back out after we uh, caught that lovely scaly 17 pounder. What I'm doing now, I'm just plunging the rod tip down, peeling off a load of slack line, just to enable the, the main line to sink and the, uh, that fluorocarbon leader that we're using also. I'm just gonna leave the line slack for a, a few moments before we clip the bobbin on. They just allow it to all sink down to the bottom. Now, um, that fish you saw me with last night, that, that 29 pounder, I mentioned that the, the take was very, very twitchy. And I think that the, the bite indication on that, on that occasion really was, was key to me, to me landing that fish. Um, and one of the things I was doing is fishing with a, a semi-slack line 
not slack. You see people with the with the rods up and there's 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 bowls of line between each rod ring. Bite indication is going to be terrible. Regardless of what you hear, your bite indication is just going to be abysmal. What I've got here is a semi-slack line, and I'm fishing with light, the light black label bobbins on a on a Dacron chain or Dacron cord. And I've got it clipped up to create this quite acute angle. And that really does maximise the bite indication, especially when we combine it with this running rig setup that we've been using. Um, and I mentioned before about the, about the leader material. It's a, a new prototype uh, fluorocarbon leader, which is different to anything else on the market. In terms of invisibility, Rob Hughes has done underwater tests, he's done diving, and he said it's the best material he's ever seen, or, or ever not seen. It really is just invisible. Um, it sinks like a brick. Uh, so what it ensures is when I'm, when I'm peeling off this slack line, the last sort of couple of yards, three, four yard, is just pinned down out of harm's way. It is virtually undetectable by the carp. And I'm also using it, the um, Exocet main line. Now, it doesn't sink like a, a fluorocarbon would, but in terms of monofilament lines, it is by far the best line I've ever used in terms of its sinking. For a distance casting line, it's very unusual, but it, it does, it sinks like a, well, not quite like a brick, but it sinks almost the same as a, as a fluorocarbon would. Now, now I like that, um, and you could say, why don't you just use a, a fluorocarbon straight through to the rig? Well. Fluorocarbons, even, even, even the more supple ones, like the Illusion XS, they still have some sort of limitations on, on the casting ability. So I prefer to use the Exocet mainline, which sinks very well indeed, and then use a, a six-foot leader of this, the new prototype material. I think what I'm going to do now, we'll take a look at the leader in a little bit more detail, and also how I attach it to the mainline. Well, here we have the leader material that's been working very well for me so far this session. And as you can see, it's a little bit different from a, your traditional fluorocarbon uh, in that it's not clear in colour. It's kind of a translucent olive green colour. And like I mentioned before, when Rob Hughes has been diving underwater, carrying out tests, he said it's by far the most invisible material that he's ever seen. Now I'm going to show you how to attach it to the main line. There's a few different knots, but this is by far the simplest and the one that I've found to be one of the strongest. It's kind of a back-to-back -back grinner, a lot of people describe it as. I have my Exocet main line in one hand, and here we have the new leader material. All we do with the main line, we wrap it round the leader material and create a loop. Then we then pass that tag end back through the same loop, a total of four times. Then pull it down almost tight. Give a little bit of saliva and then we have the this is the, now the leader material we have and we then make a loop with that onto the Exocet main line and then I pass that tag end through twice and again pull it down almost tight a little bit of saliva keep doing this at regular stages the wetter the better and all that and just tease them knots down again and just tease the two knots down together a little bit more spit and gently pull it down like that very simple and it's just a case of trimming off the tag ends and there we have it job done now many fisheries ban lead core leaders, including Fenland, where we're at for this session. So that doesn't really come into the equation. But in any case, I feel that this material is a far better option, especially in the winter months when you have clearer water. I think this is much less visible. Now I've been fishing this on a, a six foot length. That means that the leader knot is just hanging below the tip on casting. But obviously you can use it as a, uh, as a shock leader material if you want to use it in longer lengths. So there we have it. That's the new material. It's going to be available in the edges range. And as you can see, it's certainly been working very well for me on this session. Well, that's the end of my session here at Fenland, and it really has been a very memorable session indeed. When I got here, conditions weren't great. It was very cold. We had a bitterly cold wind and two harsh frosts. 
So to catch three carp live for the cameras, uh, I am absolutely delighted. And I'm certainly glad I give Harry, the cameraman, a call. Um, and he was able to come down. He, he spent last night here as well. And he was able to capture what has been one of my most memorable January sessions to date. So I'll see you soon. It wasn't hard to tell how over the moon Mark was with that particular session, and quite rightly so. I'm still sitting here waiting for a bite. I'm now under my Super Broly Compact, drinking as much tea as I can and trying to keep warm and out of this horrible easterly wind. I could do something else, but I think this is where I'm going to get a bite. I'm just hoping it happens sometime soon. You also have to be living on another planet if you hadn't seen the devastation, the flooding caused to the down in the West Country during this winter. And what effect that must have had on the poor people down there. We can only hope that their lives get back to some degree of normality sometime real soon. And it also, to a much lesser degree, affected the fishing down there. But Rob Hughes, with a few cunning tricks up his sleeve, got out on the bank and managed to get his carp fishing fix. Wow. Cast your minds back as you're sitting inside watching this and it's nice and dry to January and February of this year. And it absolutely threw it down, particularly if you live where I do, that is in the southwest. But today, I was going to say the sun's out, it's not quite, it's on its way up and that means only one thing, time to go fishing. Now we've had a bit of a problem down here, there's just been water absolutely everywhere. The river's all flooded, my syndicate lake flooded, my club lake got the river going through it. It's virtually impossible to fish down here in the southwest but there is one place where normally you know the water levels are always good and also if you're clever you know that there's some half decent carp. Now they're overlooked a lot of the time but play your cards right, you can have a great day's fishing. Where are we? Well, this place, it's a commercial lake. It's down at Somerton in Somerset, and it's called Viaduct, and more than that, it's absolutely stuffed for the doubles. didn't take long at all. <laughs> Literally 11 minutes. Most people carp angling in a situation like this would probably still be loading or unloading the barrow in the car park uh, but traveling light getting in there quick really does pay and it, I must say you know I, I, I fish all over the world uh, for, for big fish. Travel massive lakes, 1,000 acres, 5,000 acres, 10,000 acres, 20,000 acre lakes but carp fishing is just a great laugh, and that's what it's all about. None of this elitist rubbish. I'm as happy down here on a little two-acre match venue in Somerset as I am on a 20,000-acre inland sea. Light tackle, a bit of fun, and particularly in the winter. I, I, just, I, I love winter fishing, and particularly in the winter, it's so nice. Look at that, lovely mirror, and that one is probably just on the edge of £10. Boom, one in a bag. Normally, you'd be on your way to work. Now, we're angling, it's not raining, and we've caught a car. Yeah. The things I do in winter is fish for liners a lot of the time. I'm very much a, a tight line angler most of my fishing, but in the winter, particularly on waters like this, I like to semi-slack and fish for liners. 
so setting the bobbin up is really, really important. You don't want to be tight, you don't want to be ultra tight, but you don't want to be semi slack if that makes any sense. You certainly don't want to be ultra slack. So, what I've done is I've tightened it up to what I would class as semi tight, so the bobbin's got a reasonable drop on it, and then I'm just going to let a little bit more off. And that's one of the benefits of these slick bobbins. Just let it sit with the weight dangling on the end of the either the chain or the string and then it doesn't want to be bowing between your tip and where the water touches the surface it wants to seem to be tight but the tension is purely by the angle of this here and then what will happen is if a fish goes anywhere near that line I'm going to get an indication down here now it might not be a bleep on the alarms even though they're very sensitive alarms it might not be a bleep it might be a slight raise, a twitch on the bobbin. I'm looking at where the line enters the water just to see rings coming off that. But all these are signs in winter as to where the carp might be. So you'll see both of my bobbins are sitting in more or less the same position. Not quite flat, just a little bit off parallel to the floor. Indicators on. Semi-slack and I'm fishing, watching the water and also letting these find a the carp for me. This is a little bit better. He looks probably, oh, he's probably 14, 15, maybe in 16 pounds, which in any cult fishery would be quite happy with that. He's probably 14 pounds, actually. There we go, fish number three, one hour on the clock. And the nice thing about it is the tactics down here are absolutely simple as you like. Incredibly, the sun's come out. That's not something we've seen down here for a while, so I've got my shades on. You'll have to excuse me. Um, Rules. Match fisheries have different rules to us carp lads, so very, very important just to pay attention. I've, I've checked the rule board first, uh, and as a result, I've got a £12 line on. Now, a lot of the time I'd use 15 but I've swapped it over. £12 main line, just to comply with fishery rules, uh, and then the other one is uh, barbless hooks. No bigger than a size 8, so we'll come to that end in a minute. But let's talk through the setup itself. I'm using lead core, and the reason I like to use lead core in winter is I like to sort of slack and semi-slack line, so get that down and out the way, but then fish more of a slightly floating line, so I'm, I'm, I'm searching for fish by fishing for liners. So, lead core can be a bit fiddly to tie, fiddly to splice, particularly if, like me, you're getting on a bit and my eyes are going. So as a result, I just use the straight leaders out of the pack. Now, there's various different types. This one's got the quick-release clip system on it, and they come with a swivel already attached by a loop. Now, the swivel that comes on it is a bog standard loop swivel, but what I've done is I've changed the swivel over for a quick change swivel. Now, they come in the pack as well, so everything's all there, ready to rock and roll. You've got your lead core ready spliced, you've got your clip on it, you've got your swivel on it, and it's your choice as to which swivel you want. But because I like to change my rigs quite a lot, I've got a quick change one on there as well. So that's the basic setup. Camo lead core, down to a reasonable size pendant lead. Now for carp angling this is quite small, it's only a two and a half ounce, but out on these lakes, normally these lads are only using an ounce, ounce and a quarter, so this will be quite a big bolt effect for the carp themselves. Coming onto the rig, very, very short rig, and this is one of my favourite rig materials of all time. This is Camatex Stiff, and it's the light colour, it just blends in so well. You can see it's camo coloured, and then what I've done there the last bit of it, I've just stripped off a bit of a hinge because I'm using a critically balanced bait. A little bit of tungsten putty on there, some shrink tubing, and then a size eight barbless hook. Pin sharp these little babies, as you saw they sticking in my hand earlier. So that is the setup. Now, on the end, I've got a little bit of candy stick, which is this stuff here. Boilies are banned on this match venue. Some you're allowed to use, but some you're not, or some venue should I say, and on this venue you're not allowed to use boilies. So I've got these candy sticks and just literally just whittled down a small piece of it to make it into a tiny pop-up. And then I've just got a little bag of goodies nipping on a small PVA stocking of mixed pellets that have been soaked overnight in a liquid flavour and that is my starter for 10. Now the other thing that I like to use is pepper army winter time. Great bait, actually a great bait in the summer because of the high oil in it as well. 
but in winter it does come into its own and fish do seem to like it. And what I've done with this is I've whittled out the middle with a drill, put a piece of cork through the centre of it and that will either balance it or pop it up depending on what you want. And that is an absolutely fantastic winter bait as well. Just get the drill, take the centre out, stick a bit of cork through the middle, nip it off and you can balance it according to whether you want it up off the bottom or down on the bottom. And that is pretty simple. There we go. So that's ready to rock and roll. The only other thing I'll do just to add an extra bit of flavour is a bit of booster dip on there. Only a tiny little touch on there. Rub it round and solubility, believe me my friends, solubility is the key at this time of year. Fish, particularly in overstock waters, love a bit of smell. So this one is going to go back out. beauty approximately 16 pound and how's that for a proper carp from a match fishery don't ignore places like this particularly not viaduct there are some great carp to be caught and this for me is what winter carp fishing is about just getting out having a bit of a flick around in a little over an hour fishing we've caught four fish now topped by this which you know make no bones about it it's february it's been very very uh, difficult particularly down in the southwest where quite frankly we've not been able to get out it's been really really wet um, the day's a bit better today, and particularly when we're catching things like this. As you can see, it's got a really, really bright and sunny day now, which is lovely for me, but actually for the fishing, it's not quite as good at the moment. It's been about an hour now since I've had a bite. And also it's been probably half an hour, 45 minutes since I've had any liners. So that indicates to me that the fish aren't necessarily directly in front of me anymore. So what I'm going to do is pack up. I'm traveling dead light, It'll take me five minutes, just have a little walk around and see if I can find any fish anywhere. Well, as expected, they are on the surface. I've just come around the corner now uh, by the side of a place called Middlepool, just looking over here to my right. But I've just seen one or two cruising around just under the surface down here. Now, this looks absolutely perfect. It's flat, calm, it's a small, quiet bay, there's no wind on it, and it's getting a lot of sun. More to the point as well, there's an overflow pipe down there that's throwing a bit of water in, and I dare say there's going to be carp around that too. Any feature overhanging trees, water coming in stages, things like that, they're always good places to look for fish. But here at the moment, this, out of everyone, the whole complex, looks really, really good. The only thing is, we've got to creep up there quietly to get to the other side and come back towards them because we can't really fish it from this side. Now this is where it's proved to be a little bit of fun because the rules down here are that you've got to fish from permanent pegs or platforms. There is a platform right by the side of where that water comes in, but you know what, if I fish there, I'm going to catch one and that's going to be it. So what I've got to do now is stealthily like a stealthy elephant that I am, I've got to get in there. I want to drop a bait in rather than casting at them. So just drop it in and then see if I can pass the rod back around here. So uh, forgive me, this could take some time and it could prove to be quite funny. But uh, we're going to get down here very, very quietly now. Just sneaking in as quietly as we can do, trying not to skyline ourselves. Just watch the feet movements down there as well. And then I'm just going to creep forwards swing this just off the edge of the flow down there. There was a few fish there, so swing him out, pop him down, as expected, that's donked down really heavily. Now what I've got to do is get around here without falling in. Just had an absolute ripper on the walk it round and plop it on the inlet spot. And I tell you what, we just sat down thinking, oh, that should have gone. It's been half an hour or so, and it hadn't gone. I thought I'd spooked them with my elephant-like stealth tactics, charging through the undergrowth to get it in there. And uh, 
just sat there chilling, contemplating the day, life, all the sort of things that, that we contemplate as carp anglers when suddenly, the whack. And it looks like another quite nice carpy. Come on, you. Are we in? Yeah, we're in. How's that? Lovely job. The day is getting even better. Mid double, little chunky mirror. And you'll notice behind me a lodge. Now, our cameraman's parked himself in there. That's the office for the day. You can actually rent that. Uh, and this is the swim that you fish from there as well. So uh, there we go. If you fancy a trip out and a bit of a holiday and so down somewhere, then this is the place to be. Carp, decent lodgings. And of course, the kettle's not far away as well, which is always pleasant. The one on the pink mint. Just thinking, you know what, it's nearly time to pack in, but I thought, well, there's always one last chance. I think that's the angler in us, isn't it? We always just want that one last fish. Other lads around the lake are just packing up. I shall be very soon as well. But as is often the case, last knockings is the time where there's always a bite or two on the cards, and this one's a common. I haven't, uh, haven't seen a common yet. Off the inlet on the little bags Oops. and this has been I must say an absolutely fantastic day the, the weather's been great the carp have played ball everything's gone absolutely wonderfully we've had a mixed grill of weather a bit of sun a bit of rain but more to the point a bit of fun and there it is that's carp number eight for me and on that note I'll bid you farewell Rob Hughes demonstrating just how much fun winter carp fishing can be. Next up is Mark Bartlett. The England international is a carp hauler in the truest sense of the word. He's also one of the country's finest zig rig anglers. And last February one day, he went out and demonstrated just how devastating this method can be. Here we are on the bank finally. We've had so much rain last few weeks. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm from Somerset. and. Most of that's about a metre underwater at the moment. Well, we've got out for the day, we've come to sheer water, and hopefully, well, it's looking good and promising so far, we're going to uh, tear them up on the old zigs. We've got one on. looking ones that we've had this morning we've had a load of fish now um, it's still early in the session and basically all I've done to to try and find out what the best level in the water is to catch these fish on the zigs is use an adjustable zig it gives me the opportunity to uh, to vary the depth how far I'm fishing off the bottom really easy rather than cutting hook lengths down and chopping and changing it's a very simple method and it's certainly paid off this morning I'll put this one back and then we can go and have a look at exactly how I set it up. Here it is. This is the mini adjustable zig kit. It's a really simple setup as, as far as adjustable zigs go. You literally get your main line, pass it through this big eyed swivel. On the end of the boom, you put your lead on the other end. The main line then simply passes down through the stem of the float. 
You've got a nice big bead there to butt up against the, uh, the big eye swivel just to give it a bit of cushion. Line down through the stem, comes through the float and then you've got a little grommet for your swivel to sit in there and that's a, uh, a quick, change, quick change swivel which my hook link goes to. There's an anti-tangle sleeve, I hook that on, slide the sleeve over the swivel and then I've got 15 pound zig and floater hook length. This is nice and strong, I don't want it to break. Uh, I'm going to catch a lot of fish today on this, so I want it strong. If you use a light line, eventually it will snap, so 15 pound. And then that's down to a size 8 SSBP on a pink, pink and white zig liner. Um, these zig liners, they're pretty much standard procedure now in zig fishing. It saves so much hassle and that's the one. The hook length's two foot. This is quite an important, important thing. Uh, it's two foot for a reason, and I'll show you exactly why on the next stage when I chuck it out in the pond. At the start of the session, I basically used the adjuster kit as a marker float rather than mess about with a marker. I've just chucked this out to where I want to fish. I've paid a foot of line off at a time and it's told me how deep the lake is. I know now that it's just over 16 foot deep. So all I've done is I've clipped my rods up. They're all at the same distance, 80 yards. My uh, spod rod as well. This enables me to put the bait out over the top of the zigs accurately. Um, you've just seen me cast out there. Now, this morning when we've been catching the fish, I've been catching them at around 10 foot. Now, with the hook link itself, remember I said that it was important to know the length of your hook length. The length of my hook length is two foot. With the kit itself, you add another foot on because of the boom and the stem of the stem of the float. So I know that I'm starting at three foot. Now I'm catching my fish at 10 foot in 16 foot of water. So all I have to do is I've cast a rod out, which you just saw me do, and I'm simply going to pay a foot of line off at a time and this will bring the, the float up to the level that I want to fish. So I'm starting on three foot and I'm going to finish on 10 foot. So I'm simply just going to pay off seven feet of line and the float will rise up through the water. That's three, four, five, six, seven. So that's seven foot now. So my Hook bait itself is at 10 foot. It's dead simple. Whatever depth you want, you just add on to the uh, add on to the distance, the length of your hook length. Now I know that now that's in the zone, and hopefully, touch wood, I should get a bite on that rod. And if I don't get a bite in, you know, in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, all I'm going to do is adjust the depth. The fish are obviously they've either moved, you know, moved the level that they're sitting at, so I can either pay off a couple of feet of line and try a bit higher up or I can just put a few turns of the spool back on and take the zig down if I feel like the fish have dropped down. Time will tell. literally just put that rod out, put a spot over the top and we're in. Not bad for February. The session's going really well, catching plenty of fish. Um, what has become really apparent is the depth that we're catching at. We're catching all the fish at around 10 foot off the bottom and it's been great using the adjuster zigs to find out what depth they are at. We've tried different depths and 10 foot is the depth that the fish are willing to sit at today. It's where they want to be, where they're most comfortable. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and speed it up a little bit, become a bit more efficient, get a few more bites and catch a few more fish quickly. And uh, I'll show you exactly how to do that. Now we found out where they're, uh, where they're sitting. Here we go. Right, we're on phase two now. We've used the adjustable zig. We've caught a load of fish on them, but we've used them to find out where the fish want to sit. And we found today at the minute they're sitting at 10 foot. 
it's become apparent that that's where they want to be. We've tried different depths and 10 foot is the one. So what we're going to do now to enable us to fish quicker is we're going to switch over from the adjustable zig to a leg clip setup. Now this is just a straightforward leg clip setup as though you're fishing on the bottom. Tail rubbers push firmly on. I've done this so I'm not dropping the lead on every fish. I don't want to be losing 50 leads. So the lead will only come off now if it comes into contact with a snag or something in the lake. Um, other than that, it's going to stay on there. Now, these are uh, new for us. These are the extra long anti-tangle sleeves. It's something that we've been working on and they've proven to work wonders with the zigs. It just keeps the, the zig away from the main line that extra little bit. And it's just a helping hand really. And then our hook length is 10 foot long now. So there's no messing about. So all I've got to do is cast out, hit the clip, lead down on the deck. And as soon as I've done that, I know that my hook bait is fishing at 10 foot rather than have to pay the line off with the adjustable zigs. I'm fishing straight away. So the rod's down, the bobbin's on, and any movement on the indicator is gonna be a fish. And hopefully it will just get us those bites a little bit quicker. So there's no messing around. Go and give it a go. I've just cast a rod out there, and one change we have made is I've switched over my indicators. I've moved to a springer arm. This is to gain more tension on the line when I'm fishing. Again, this is only going to result in better bite indication. We couldn't use them with the adjusters because of the tension, it would just keep dragging the float under. So we've changed over to the springer arms, and that's going to give me a better bite registration which is all the name of the game. Well, despite it being February, we've managed to plow our way for a bucket of bait. Um, just in case you're unsure of what to use while spotting over the zigs, I'll just run through you with what I'm using. It couldn't be any simpler really. It's just some quality hemp. Just a bit of a bit of cooked hemp. And then just some cloudy spot mix. There's loads of these. Uh, doesn't really matter which one you use. Just give that a mix up. All this is going to do is just as it falls down through the water, it's just going to release loads of little goodies and some attraction just somewhere just to just to keep the fish in your area, that's all. You can see now that's going lovely. And then, because I'm using the old yellow zig aligners, I'm going to put some corn in there. You can't go wrong with a bit of corn. Some a few boilies in there as well. And this will just give a bit of colour while your bait's falling down through the water. The hemp really just bulks the mix out and then uh, the actual part that's doing the damage is the actual cloud mix itself. And that's it, couldn't be any simpler. When you're spotting over zigs you could get a double take or even worse, you could have a spot out on the spot and get a bite at literally the same time. So if I give you one tip for that, is just, just take, well, not take your time, but wind your spot in first before you deal with the fish. It'd be a lot easier, otherwise you'll end up in a, in a right to and fro. Just, uh, just wind the spot in as quickly as you can and, uh, and then deal with the fish afterwards, like you see me do then. Here's one, and another, and another, Ooh, and another, and another. Tell you what, I found this chewing a zig liner 80 yards out there. Silly boy. about that. What perfect way to end the day. 
I've had an absolutely awesome day's fishing today. Bearing in mind it's February, um, you can ask for a better day's fishing. I've caught fish after fish after fish on really simple tactics. And it's something that I do throughout the whole year. It only gets better as the year goes on. Pick the right venue and you yourself can go out and you can catch an absolute shed load of fish like this. Brilliant. What an incredible tactic zig rig fishing is when you're prepared to put the effort in. My 24 hour session is coming to a close quite rapidly. A session where I've had to endure the most awful easterly winds. But I've caught a couple of carp and I can't tell you how happy I am about that. We hope you've enjoyed the sessions that you've seen. Sessions where our guys have had incredible success from a whole host of different environments. But most of all, we hope you've gleaned some edges, edges that you can use in your own fishing to great effect. So, from everyone at Fox, here's hoping the season to come is full of the carp of your dreams.